the session is there we go good afternoon everybody my name is allison mclaughlin i am the acting election director for montgomery county you are here for our virtual chief briefing for the 2022 gubernatorial general election we are going to take advantage of the um, technology that we have here to um, get all of our key people here on our staff from the Board of Elections to give you some brief updates, but we're going to try to respect your time and make sure that we keep it as brief as we can mm -hmm. um, and try to avoid repeating ourselves for you all today. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just start off by saying thank you. I know that you have all um, taken on a big responsibility in stepping into a leadership role out at the polls on election day, or we may have some rumors on this call as well. Um, it is a um, very much appreciated service that you are providing. And I, I just want to start off this meeting by saying how much we, we deeply appreciate the work that you are putting into this exercise of democracy um, and uh, really getting the, the show on the road for us on Tuesday. Just a few things that I wanna highlight, and then I'm gonna go ahead and pass the microphone, pass the camera off to some of my colleagues here, is that we are here to serve the voters. We are here to serve all voters who arrive between 7 a.m. and 8 p.m. on election day. And so uh, the first thing that I just want to make sure that everyone holds deeply as a charge is that we're making sure that we get those doors open promptly at 7 a.m. That includes if we're having some sort of technical difficulty, the solution to a technical difficulty is not to have the voters wait. The voters are to be allowed to enter the room promptly at 7 a.m. for the polls to open. Uh, and all you really, at a worst case situation, you need to make sure you've got one poll book functional and one scanner functional to make sure that you are ready to serve those voters um, in the event that you should run into any problems. Um, that also the doors will close promptly at 8 p.m. or I should say the last voter waiting in line, pardon me, will be permitted to vote if they have arrived by 8 p.m. And for this election, or for some of you who have worked with us in the 2020 election, the new piece to that is the drop boxes. And so it is our shared responsibility to make sure that we also close the polls at the drop boxes if you have one of them at your polling place. And that's going to be those of you who are at a high school. It's going to be those of you who are at one of our early voting sites. And there are a few other locations where we have a drop box. If you have a drop box at your location, then you have the instructions, you have the kit, it's in the olive bag that we've sent out to you. And we just need to ask you to take on that new added responsibility of making sure that you and your team have the instructions and, and go out there and um, handle the closing of the Dropbox as well as the closing of your site. That is the one sort of key wrinkle in our standard opening to closing operation. Um, we are here for you. You all have um, our number at 240-777-8543 for our help desk. And we are um, on call for you to assist you in serving voters at that number. We will be doing the text messaging that many of you have experienced before to communicate out to you and to have you send back to us a confirmation. It's a poll that you reply to by pressing one or two or whatever the prompt is. Um, to let us know when you are um, set up and running on Monday night, when you're ready to open the polls on Tuesday morning, and when you've left the building on Tuesday evening. And we do want you to use that text messaging feature at those times because we have a limited capacity to handle 230 phone calls all coming in simultaneously at once. But other than that, um, those moments where we need you to um, work with us in managing that call volume, we are ready and on the phones for you at our help desk um, in the interest of serving voters um, as we all are eager and excited to do. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Aisha Mills Farigo, our recruiting coordinator, who's gonna talk first about some staffing issues and just um, some reminders. And then we're gonna hand the microphone over to Chris Ezit, who is going to talk about operational physical issues out there at the polls. And then Hilberto Zelaya is going to talk about the media and talk about um, uh, the students that we have out there to assist you on election day. And, um, and then Julia is going to handle procedural updates for you and, and anything else that we haven't covered. 
I'm going to pass the mic on to Aisha. There you go. Okay. Um, okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you guys all for attending today. And uh, those of you who participated in bag pickup today, thank you so much for um, picking up your bag. Um, I do want to um, address one thing. I know in the email that I sent you guys, it said you could um, ask questions in the chat, but unfortunately the chat has been disabled. So if you have a question at the end, um, please raise your hand and we'll have someone um, adjust it so that you could ask your question. Um, I do, again, want to thank you guys very much for um, stepping up and volunteering for this role as chief. It is an important role and, um, you know, we couldn't manage the precincts without your guys' for participation. So thank you again. Um, I do wanna talk about some of the staffing roles that we have, also the payroll sign-in sheets. And um, Allison already spoke to you about the, um, the Dropbox attendance. Um, so first, um, just talking about the payroll sheet. Uh, so we use the payroll sheet as a sign-in sheet just to make sure that everybody who is supposed to be there is supposed to be there. I know that when we volunteer, you can volunteer and that we do provide a service stipend. Some people decline or there's SSL hours, but and we just want to make sure that everybody who um, is accounted for. Also, if people show up to the precinct and they're not on the sign-in sheet, we would like for you guys to give us a call because we need to uh, make sure that that person is authorized to be in the precinct. We have had some issues where people, you know, have reported and they said they're supposed to be here, but they actually weren't official election judges, so they um, shouldn't have been there. Um, the payroll sheet that you have now is what we have up to date, but we did have two classes today and we have two classes tomorrow, so there may be some additions to your payroll sheets. Not everyone's, but some will have additions. And two things um, that we will do is, one, I'll have the recruiters reach out to you if there are um, adjustments to your payroll. But also, if you have a moment, please look at your EJ Connection account where you'll see the most up-to-date information. They will be here today and tomorrow adding those names of people who completed training so that um, you guys can have a full compliment on Tuesday. Um, in terms of filling out the payroll sheet, on Monday night, there's um, a section where it says, you know, set up meeting. The person would just have to put their initials. And on the election day event, you could have them sign. If someone does not report that day, please just write no show um, where they would have signed their name. And if someone arrives, um, we'll say for election day and their shift is to start at 6 a.m. and they arrive at 7.30, please put the adjusted time on, on the left side, I'm sorry, on the right side of that form. There is an area that says um, if there's an alteration or adjusted time if needed. Uh, we just wanna account for what time people are arriving and um, also make sure that people are you know, honoring their commitment to serve that day. Um, in terms of positions, um, oh, and also chiefs, remember to sign by your name on the roster and also um, sign the, bo the bottom of the roster so that you can certify that everyone um, did report that day. I did hand out um, in your packets today, there was a information sheet. You probably can't see this very well, but it does have the recruiter's information on the bottom there. So um, you should have one of those in your packet. If you have to reach out to us um, in the morning or anytime during the day, please um, feel free to contact us directly. Um, let's see. So uh, the Dropbox attendants, we do have a specific position for Dropbox attendants. They are listed on your payroll sheet as uh, CLS-NT, which stands for Closer NTs. Um, those will be designated um, for the Dropbox um, to monitor the Dropbox and lock the Dropbox at eight o'clock. And they should have a packet, but um, our operations team can speak to you on what's in the packet. I uh, just wanted you to be aware that those people would be reporting and not all of them have been assigned. So that would be an addition to your payroll sheet um, for Tuesday. Um, our closers and our drivers, if you are operating with one closer, um, we, I would ask that if you could have someone of a different political um, party, please ride back with the closer. 
Um, we do offer a $25 additional stipend for anyone who hops in the car with the closer, but they we just ask that they're a different party affiliation. Um, and then if you have a, if you're operating without, okay. uh, if you're operating without a, um, a VOP driver, um, the VOPs are trained the same way as the VOP drivers, uh, with the exception of um, learning where the regional site tech is and what, what you would take to the regional site. Um, if you could have someone volunteer to do that, that um, party affiliation doesn't, um, the party affiliation doesn't matter at that point. Anybody could volunteer to do that. I think most case, most precincts are pretty staffed with a, a driver, so it might not be an issue, but if for some reason, um, you don't have one, that would be the protocol for that. And if you are a solo chief, I would ask that you have someone of a different party affiliation sign off on your paperwork. And if you have any questions or need help identifying that person, um, the recruiters would be able to help you with that. And I think that's all I wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, our recruiters will be here at five o'clock, 5.30 on election day. So if you need to report anyone um, not showing up or showing up, um, showing up late or anything like that, please feel free to give us a call. Okay, and I believe the next- Allison. Um, Chris is gonna speak next. Allison. Yes. Before you go on, are you taking press questions down? Are you? It's all to the end because people are raising their hands. It's on till the end, but raising okay. hands is good. Uh, Chris no, is the next who's going to speak. Okay. Chris, I think you may be muted. Now you're good. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to echo, this is Chris from Operations, and I'm going to echo what Alison and Aisha have already said to you. We extend our thank yous. Your service does not go unnoticed. Board of Elections could not connect, conduct the elections without you. I applaud you and all of our staff applaud you. So thank you very much. I'm gonna run over a few comments that seem to be overarching concerns or questions that I have noticed that have come up and I'm gonna run through them real, really quick. If you have any questions, you can put them in the chat and we'll try to addre address them. First of all, all of your voting equipment um, has most of it has been delivered by now. There are a few uh, sites that will receive their voting equipment Monday, but I need you to note that if you're out at your site, poll books have not been delivered, but they will all be delivered on Monday. Another thing while we're talking about equipment, if you should get out on Monday night and you discover that you cannot find a piece of equipment or any of your equipment, please don't labor in looking through the building on your own. The staff here has documentation on where those pieces are stored in the building. The quickest way would be for you to reach out to the help desk and we'll be able to research the information and tell you exactly where your equipment is stored. Don't spend a lot of time when we can get the information for you quickly. Um, uh, part of another question that has been coming up, most locations are scheduled to start their chief's meeting or their chief and uh, election judge preparation meeting on 630. I know some of you have uh, arranged for an earlier time and that's okay, but please be mindful. Most MCPS locations won't be available for you in the polling room until 630 to uh, Monday night. Um, next thing is, oh, I mentioned about your equipment. Please call us if, if you have any any issues with finding your equipment. Uh, the polling room will be available for you 
at 6 a.m. on Monday or Tuesday. And if you have any issues, please call us. We have contacts so that we can get you into the room really quick. So let us know if you have problems accessing the building at 6 a.m. on Tuesday. Voter access, that is one of the foremost issues for all of us. We want voters to feel that they're welcomed and that they're able to get to their polling place. It appears sometimes that um, the touch plates, the push plates, the ADA operational button that opens the door seems to be a problem. Those plates should be operational in all of the MCPS locations. Lots of the lots of times the doors have been locked, so the ADA plate is not being used. What you need to do is ask your building service manager if they'll turn on the ADA push plate. There is a mechanism over the door that they have the access to that they should be able to turn on that plate. Now, if it's so that you can't use that, let me um, say that most of those doors are accessible. All of these locations have been assessed for ADA compliancy. The door handles, the weight of the door, pass ADA regulations. So you should be able to allow someone to come through that door without worrying about using the push plate, but try to activate the push plate if you can with that on or off switch. Another thing is fundraisers. There have been several people contacting the board about conducting a fundraiser in most or a lot of the locations. This is allowed inside the building, not in the polling room. And I will tell you that anyone that is conducting an, a fundraiser in your facility should have approval from the Board of Elections. They have been asked to carry their approval information with them. It's an email from the board saying that they have approval to conduct a fundraiser. If you have any issues, again, give us a call. Another thing, some of the buildings, the corridors are long. And with some of our voters, mobility becomes an issue. We have put in your sign bag a poster, which uh, is designated a rest area. Follow the instructions on the back of that poster and you can set up a rest area when you feel that the walk, the pathway to your room is too long and that some individuals might like to sit and take a rest before they get to the polling room. Phone lines. Now they are questionable. We have been having issues with Verizon. We have been trying to work with Verizon to get the lines operational. Some are still not operational. And so I have sent out cell phones where we can. And then chiefs, you're encouraged to have your cell phone with you at all times so we can communicate with you. Look for that yellow dot on the jacks in your room. If you find the yellow jack, you should be able to use that jack. That is the BOE designated landline for you to hook up the instrument, the telephone. And then lastly, uh, Ms. McLaughlin mentioned about the drop boxes. It is imperative that we, uh, this will be the third time you've heard this today, but it's imperative that we uh, close those boxes at eight. There's a packet for the person that is designated, the VOP that's designated to close the box at eight. The packet includes uh, an olive bag, which is intended to collect any ballot that might arrive at the box while it's being locked. That is a container that you can put the ballot in or have the voter put the ballot in. You will have the uh, VOP seal that and it will come back to the board. It has chain of custody in the packet. There's a key to lock the box in the packet. 
we do not encourage um, the VOPs that are closing the box to engage in conversation with the voters if they arrive with a late ballot. The uh, VOP is instructed just to take the ballot. There is a blue card in the packet that they can hand off to the voter if the voter has questions about their ballot. And that is all that I have to say other than I wish you luck on Tuesday. We're well, here if you need something. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Zelaya would like to talk to you about future vote. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Gilberto Zelaya. I'm the uh, coordinator um, of Future Vote since 2004. And thank you so much for everyone who's helping us out. Uh, buttress this opportunity to promote participatory democracy for our students in Montgomery County. Each corresponding precinct will have their trained and vetted future vote ambassadors. I'm going to go with some talking points uh, to make sure that you follow. Um, guardian participation at Monday evening's precinct setup is mandatory. Once again, not only for the guardian, but for the students. I, I, I I understand that you know at times there's a concert or football, uh, there's playoffs or ballet. If the child doesn't serve on Monday, they do not report to service on Tuesday, no exceptions. Um, during your precinct setup, please, before you meet on uh, Monday, you need, to you need to contact the students on your corresponding roster. Um, they are eagerly awaiting uh, a call or an email with instructions with your particular setup. I know uh, Ms. Izzet mentioned that uh, historically the setup is at 6.30. If you are meeting before or after the 6.30 uh, start time, please ensure that you communicate clearly to the guardians what time your meeting will begin. Um, haven't, hold on, Jerry. <laughs> now he's calling me. <laughs> so uh, um, in addition, make sure that they sign the Monday and the corresponding slot for election day on the roster. I will email each student the corresponding SSL forms after we certify the election. So please do not sign any MCPS private parochial school uh, credits uh, beforehand. Um, having said that, uh, in addition, uh, make sure that the students um, serve uh, as per your re requirements. What they can uh, do is um, return the folders from the scanning unit back to the check-in table. They will greet uh, the voters. They will pass out the I voted sticker, uh, encourage our voters to submit uh, the survey, the exit survey. They make sure that there's no partisan literature uh, laying around the polling place. Uh, an overview summary of what the students can and cannot do will be emailed to you. So if you could please review, it's about five uh, slides that will contain all of this information. Also make sure that the student uh, who appear on both Monday and Tuesday's rosters are the only ones serving on election day. No walk-ons, even if a student has participated in the past, if they are not trained and they're not vetted, just like your adult poll workers, they are not, they're not vetted to serve. Um, if they have any questions, they could, call, uh, they could call me or email me. They have my information. Um, please adhere to the names on the roster once again. And the guardian must pick up and drop off their child on election day. Um, they could assign a proxy, uh, an, an adult sibling, an uncle, um, but the child cannot um, walk home after their shift. Um, they must be picked up and dropped off by a guardian or a proxy. On Monday, the guardian uh, was clearly communicated that they must assist. Uh, also, this is where you would communicate your expectations for service. Um, and then once you're done with them for the first 45 minutes to an hour of setup, you could send the student and the corresponding guardian back home and you could focus on setting up the equipment and ballots. Uh, as it pertains to observers and watchers, only individuals vetted by the State Board of Elections can serve as observers or watchers. Anyone else must be turned away. You must uh, encourage them to contact the State Board of Elections if they just show up at your polling place uh, to observe or, or watch the process. 
the media, we have a handful of media uh, that will be visiting. I have provided them the credentials. I will email the corresponding chief judges of those locations in which the corresponding news outlets are planning to visit. Um, this information is on your, um, your, your manual, uh, but of course, identify a location where the media could just record some B-roll uh, for, uh, for their spots. They cannot interview voters inside the polling place, inside the polling room, and they cannot go live uh, inside the polling room. That needs to be done outside, um, uh, but they have been given the corresponding credentials. If uh, media do show up, whether they have credentials or not, make sure they sign the uh, sign-in sheet and provide them the instructions. But please identify the location where you will like the media to set up a camera uh, just to take some B-roll. But once again, they cannot uh, talk or speak with our voters while they're voting and any interviews must be done outside. Um, and uh, I think we touched about uh, observers and watchers, the media, at any time you could call the help desk. Um, or you could contact me directly. I'll be floating around the county. Uh, and if you have, uh, we will provide my cell phone and you could text me as well. Thank you. Okay. We're going to, um, uh, Aisha had something to add quick and then we're gonna move on to Julia. Go ahead, Aisha. I'm sorry, guys. I just wanted to mention one more thing. Um, on election day, if you have election judges who haven't had an opportunity to vote yet, and they are assigned to their home precinct, please allow those um, judges to vote if they wish. Um, they can do it on their assigned break, take off their badges and then vote. If you have somebody who is not assigned to their home precinct and they still would like to vote, they must do so provisional, but please do not um, prohibit them from doing so. And then also um, our newsletter came out a couple of days ago and I did send an email, but if you have a chance to read that, please do. It has some um, important information for the election workers. And if you could remind your election judges to maybe take a look at it on Monday night, uh, Tuesday before they come into work. So that's okay. Thank you. And Julia, we'll cover everything else that we haven't <laughs> talked about yet. Okay. Hello, everyone. <laughs> this will be the boring portion of it. Um, what I'm going to go over is um, updates and reminders uh, more oriented toward the procedural uh, uh, matters in the precinct. I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, a lot of people have had questions about this uh, the ballot marking device. One of the changes that has occurred since many of you were trained is that at closing, you are not going to remove the memory stick from the ballot marking device. Uh, again, the, the ballot marking device memory stick will remain. Uh, it, it will not go in the black bag. Part of the package you received when you picked up today, you have an updated a document with this updated closing procedures. So you're going to take that page and replace the one that's in your binder, and it, it will it will re, uh, re reflect this change. And you'll simply just put tamper tape over that lock and record the number on your integrity report as you uh, normally would. The other thing is the chain of custody forms will still mention the BMD stick. Please ignore that. They were printed already uh, before this change occurred. So you can just leave that blank. As always, if you have any questions about it, you can call the help desk uh, start, um, Monday or Tuesday. The other thing with the ballot uh, with the ballot marking device is we did have some instances of uh, jams with the, uh, the ballot division card. Um, one of the things that we found that helps with this is to just be very careful when that ballot uh, activation card is being inserted. Your job guide will tell you to have to allow the voter to insert the card themselves. Um, that is the preference, but the election judge can also do this to start it. Uh, the key is to do, it, to do it gently. And also, so if the election judge does do it, but, and if the voter says, they, they don't want the judge to judge them, please allow the voter to do that. The other thing with, with the ballot division card is there are, I mean, with the, ballot, with the ballot marking device, the judge does need to touch the screen, to especially in the consolidated precinct to indicate which uh, precinct it is. They're verifying that they, they're touching the activation button to start it. And remind your judges to inform the voters, this is what you're doing. 
This is some, we have had some uh, concerns about this. We have some of the feedback from early voting that they weren't sure what the judges were doing when they were touching the screen. So please, when you have your Monday night meeting, go over this and all the updates, please. Everything I'm telling you, you're going to get a copy of all the all the all these uh, in a bullet point form of all these updates. But please share them with your uh, election judges. Um. We've in class, most of you should have heard about this, but just in case it wasn't covered, um, there is the return pass, this thing that was introduced during the primary. It, the idea is if all, and I mean all of your BMDs are not working and the judge and, and the voter does not want to vote a paper ballot, then you have a, a document called a return pass. And it's, it is going to be issued to the voter to tell them that they can return, they can leave the precinct and return once the ballot marking device is operational. So what you would be doing is giving them an estimate of the time that we think uh, that they would be up and working. They would still have to check in again. The difference is when they do get to the BMD, they will be moved to the front of the line. Our hope is that this, will not, this is not something that you will have to use because we do have several uh, ballot marking device in our precinct. So it should be a rare instance that they're all not working and that the voter also would elect not to use the paper ballot. But this is something that we do want to make sure you're aware of. You have the procedures for all of this in your binder, in your chief's binder, under the ballot marking tab. If that voter does elect to leave, you want to make sure you cancel their back and then they check in again. Um, provisional voting is the next area I want to talk about. This and then ties in back to that ballot marking device. The, the provisional voters will be allowed to use the ballot marking device upon request. There will be no designated provisional BMD in that area. So, so your provisional judge and all your VOPs must be very uh, careful to monitor when a provisional voter is using the BMD to ensure that they get back to the provisional area. Um, all judges in the precinct need to be watchful for this, as, as in any case, we don't want a provisional voter accidentally casting that ballot to scanning unit. And so if they're using the ballot marking device, this means extra vigilance to make sure this doesn't occur. Um, the other thing with provisional, you know, we, 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 we went over this in class, but based on some th um, what we've seen in early voting, I think it's, it's going to bear repeating make sure the provisional applications are being completely filled out, both for official use side that the judge completes and the voter side. And then every field must be completed. This includes line six. Line six is where it asks for the um, Maryland driver's license number or Maryland ID. Uh, that's 6A, 6B, ask for the last four digits of the social security number. The voter needs to put one of these numbers on that. If the voter does not have either of these, they have never been issued a driver's license or ID or social security number, they must check box C. Box C is, box 60 is not for the voter who uh, simply cannot remember the number or doesn't have it with them. This is solely for the purpose of people who do not possess either of these items. When that box is checked, this will trigger the BOE staff back here to do further research on this voter and they will contact them to tell them the next steps they need to do. Okay, but what you as a chief and you need to remind your provisional judges about is to make sure that one of those boxes is complete as for the, and the whole application is complete. Um, the other thing I want you to be mindful of with provisional, and this ties into the same day registration, is that there's a, only two codes to be used for same day registration for, for provisional. That's gonna be code 11, which means the voter was not pre-qualified to vote, and code 12, which means the voter could not uh, provide a proof of residency. The code we do not want to see you use is number one. Even though it does say the voter is not listed on the precinct register, that is that is a that code is to be used uh, for someone who is out of precinct, who is a previously registered voter. So 
remind all your remind both your same day registration judge and your provisional judges that if it's a same day registrant registrant the codes they should, and and they had to vote provisional the codes they should be looking for are 11 and 12 and as i said all this is written down on a document um, that i'm going to give to you you will have all your job guides will be there including the complete set of same day registration uh, information Three-page ballot. I know this has caused some consternation uh, during training. I know mo a lot of you have worked during early voting. So hopefully by experiencing that, you've seen that it, it um, presents less problems than people may have been anticipating. Um, the key thing is to remember that it's one ballot that consists of three pages. They're designated page one of three, two of three, three of three. Um, they, and when it goes to the scanning unit, they're going to submit uh, at one page at a time. If the voter elects not to mark all three pages, they are allowed to do that. We do encourage them to vote all the pages. In training, uh, the, our VOP judges were trained what to do in the case of a blank ballot being cast. You simply hit that button. It, it gives you a choice of cast and return. You want them to cast that blank ballot um, because it, like I said, the preference is for all three pages to actually get scanned. The other thing to be aware of with that three page ballot is if the voter makes a mistake on any page, you only need to spoil that page and replace that page. Uh, you don't have to do it as a set, only that page. When completing the, uh, the um, Spoiled ballot log, the spelled ballot tally sheet, you only need to account for page one. So we would spoil any page, page one, page two, page three, put that page in the spoiled ballot envelope, but only we only have to put a tally mark if it is a page one. Uh, part of, again, the part of that packet that you picked up today has a document entitled Procedures for a Three-Page Ballot. It goes over what I just said, uh, in addition to some other concerns you might have. The next item I want to address is consolid consolidated precincts. There's a, um, over 20 this time. If you are in a consolidated precinct, you will have an additional document in that last minute packet that you receive, um, going over uh, the procedures for that. Most of you, if you should be, if you, if you served in a, if you were chief, a lot of you, if you're, you're going back to that consolidated precinct, although some of them may have changed because some of them were temporary consolidated precincts because facilities were closed and not available to us. Uh, but in, in most cases, you should be returning back to consolidated precinct. That uh, document is a four-page document. It goes over the procedures. The key thing to know is that you share staff, you share voting equipment, you share most forms. The main thing that is different is that there's, multi, there's two, or in a couple of cases, three sets of ballots that are tied to that individual precinct. And you want to make sure that the voter gets the uh, ballot that goes to that, you know, from the correct precinct. You're going to use the ballot, the uh, that voter authority card. You want to pay attention to what that assigned precinct is and to make sure they get the same, the right ballot. In in most cases, when, when space is available, you are going to have separate ballot tables. In your supplies, you have different colored tablecloths. I believe they are yellow and purple. And so you're going to use that to designate the different precincts. Uh, if there's a very small precinct, it'll just be a very small quantity of ballots. The chief judge can hold those. And then uh, when that voter gets to the ballot table, the ballot table judge will alert the chief that you need one of those uh, those ballots. And as I said, this is all spelled out in that, that document um, that you received today uh, called Consolidated Precincts. The other thing um, is that at closing, when you close the scanning unit, the the process is the same with one additional step is that you'll have the two automatic um, reports that are printed, but the third one you would need to generate manually. And instead of having the combined results, you will have one that is precinct specific and you have instructions to do that. Uh, that is the, the, the main differences that you're gonna find in those consolidated precincts. 
On election day, you will be visited by uh, polling place support personnel. Uh, this year, that role is being played by the League of Women Voters. They are allowed to be there. They will come in. They will identify themselves. They must sign in. Um, they need to meet with the chief judge. They'll have an evaluation form. They'll have questions for you to answer. They are allowed to move around the precinct um, unescorted as they go through their checklist. Um, be aware that they are not a BOE staff. They are not election judges. So they're not there to answer your questions about procedures. Some of them have served as election judges. They may be familiar, but understand their role there is to evaluate the precinct to make sure that you are in compliance with our various procedures. One of the things they're gonna focus on, I'll tell you so that you can be aware, is on your signage. So make sure you have everything posted. Uh, any sign that we send out to you, make sure it's hanging up with your equipment. Make sure if it's instructions to use that equipment, that the poster is next to that piece of equipment. The other thing um, is that they once they once they complete that evaluation form, they will leave it with you. It's fine for you to read it over. Uh, some of them will go over it with you, give you a chance. To, if they do see something that needs correction, they usually will give you a chance to correct that. Um, but you can read it, but make sure that you put that back in the envelope that they gave you, and you put that envelope in the chief's binder because that does need to be returned to BOE. I suggest that you put it in the binder in the back pocket, but just make sure it gets back to us. Um, roamers, we will have election day roamers. They are going to be uh, assigned to, to um, general areas. So it's not going to be so much specific to each precinct, but you will have roamers available that you can call uh, to ask with some of the procedural questions. They can deliver material for you. Um, in some cases, you're, if you on your facilities report, you might not have an, an actual name. It may say BOE staff. In that case, there will be someone available here who can come out to you. Very often, it's going to be an IT uh, uh, personnel available. But in all cases, there will be field support available. Uh, it just, it, it might not just be a specific person. Um, the role of the roamer is to provide feel like on the ground assistance with those procedural questions and to deliver the materials, but you still have the help desk available to you. And in some cases, the promos will also be calling the help desk, help desk to get that direct troubleshooting assistance. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is something that has comes up every election is the usage of the phones. Um, overall, the use of phones in any electronic device is prohibited in the polling room. Voters are allowed to have their devices with them outside of the precinct in the hallway leading up to the poll room. But once they enter the voting area, they are to have them put away. They're not allowed to talk on them. They're not allowed to pull up their sample ballot. Um, they cannot take pictures. The caveat to this is the, that in the case where we will come up with same day registration and provisional, if the voters has their uh, ID or residency information on their phone, they are allowed to show this to the judge. This is something that's new, something that was put in effect during the primary. So that is the one instance where the voter is allowed to have that phone out. Um, what we ask is that instead of don't, Instead of asking them to turn the phone off, just tell them to put it away. That is, the signs will say off, but that is the complaint that we've gotten that it's that there's an aggressive uh, uh, enforcement of the phone policy for them to turn it off. We simply need them to have it not out and visible and not using it in the polling room. Election judges also are not allowed to use their phones in the, they, they should they should not have them out in the polling room. They should not have it in the breaks. Um, remember the judges, you are not allowed to leave the polling place. And that includes the parking lot, going out to your car. Um, the only judges who are allowed to, have, to use their cell phones on election day are the chief judges. They are allowed to, because that's how we communicate with them. They are allowed to use those cell phones for official business. The VOPD driver, 
and the closing judges are allowed to use their cell phones at the end of the election. Again, because we need that, we need them to have their phones on so that we can communicate with them when they are in transport with the, with the material. That's, that completes my portion of this. I believe now we're gonna turn it back over to Alex soon and we'll start taking questions. Thank you. Okay. And we have quite a few hands up. So here's how we're going to proceed with this. I'm going to ask any of you, all of you, I'm going to ask you to ask yourself first whether the question that you want to raise right now has to do is, is information that is for everybody, is a clarification for everyone's benefit, or if it is an issue that really just relates to you and your specific polling place. If this is an issue that really just relates to you and your specific polling place, then I'm going to ask you to take your hand down for now and hold that question until the end or think about whether you can handle that question just in a one-on-one -on -one communication with your recruiter or with us here in the help desk um, or with the contact information that you have, any email address or phone number you have with staff here with the board having to do with that issue only as a matter of prioritizing for the group. Um, for all of you who have your hand up, I'm going to assume that your question is of general interest for everyone or something that is of benefit for everyone in the group to participate in. And I'm just going to go down the list in the order that I see your name on the screen. Um, and so Janet or Jerry, do I have you um, ready to unmute people as I call on them? Yes, I'm okay. promoting them. I'm promoting them to panelists so we can see them, but they have to accept it on the screen. Even better. I just promoted Raj, but he didn't accept. So let me try it again. Okay. I know he did. Here he comes. Raj, good. Raj, you have to unmute yourself. First question. Kind of a two-step process. First, you'll get, when I call on you, you'll get an alert on your screen that asks if you're willing to be promoted to a panelist. And then after you say yes to that, then you need to unmute your device if you have it muted. He just unmuted himself. Okay, I'm unmuted, hi. Hi, Raj. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. During early voting, we were told that if anybody came more than 15 minutes late for their assignment, do not allow them to work. You have to call the recruiter and only after the recruiter gives permission to start late that they can do so. Is that still true for general election? Um, so we really would like to know, we need everybody to work. Um, we have the assigned times for a reason. Um, they need to be there on time, but sometimes life happens and they are tardy. We ask that the election judges call us and let us know. But if you have someone who's late, please, you know, let us know and also just document what time they do arrive. It's likely that they, they might be needed in the precinct. So we will allow them to work. Okay. Thank you. That's a change because in early voting, we were not allowed to do that. Thank you. Thank, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The next person on the list is going to be David Levin. Hi, David. Hi there. Okay. Two questions. Uh, the vote, the um, drop box, is there a time limit if people show up at the drop box? Are they also need to show up by eight o'clock? So who, which things go in the olive bag? The rule for the drop box is the same as for the polls. Uh, it's the last voter who is waiting in line. If you have a line, which is not common, but if you have a line at the drop box, then it would be the last voter waiting in line. Um, and then the uh, you have the key in order to lock the flap so that no more ballots can be put inside the box after that last voter waiting in line at eight o'clock. There is, however, a supplemental container that is four ballots that are returned too late, that are returned after that flap is locked. Those ballots are um, are brought back here. You have a card that you can give the voter in that case. The policy decision of what to do in those cases, whether to simply turn the voter away or whether to go ahead and accept the ballot. And then that gives the voter the opportunity to plead their case, to come before our board and make the argument that perhaps we locked the flap too early, something like that. 
So there is a container where two late ballots can be returned to the board, but they can't be put in the actual drop box after the last voter in line at eight o'clock. Okay, second question. Um, this uh, part about the uh, three page ballot being spoiled. What was the thing about the first page only? So in the case of if the voter needs to replace page one, the ballot that is actually designated as page one of three, if that is the one that needs to be spoiled, that's the one that you're going to mark on the tally sheet. If it's page two of three or page three of three, you do not indicate that one on the tally sheet. The reason is that okay. on the um, scanning unit, only that page one will increment the public count on the scanning unit. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you, that's it. Thank yeah. you. So if there's an issue that you know we might need to have the information on, you can always, of course, record that in your chief judge log. If there's something that you think would be lacking in the spoiled ballot tally sheet, if there's sort of a story behind some voter situation. Um, but from an accounting standpoint for that tally log, we just need the, the page one on that sheet. The next um, question is from Ron Schlesinger. No, it's from Lynn. I already moved her. Oh, I'm sorry. Lynn Parsons. Hi, Lynn. Hi, I'm sorry. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, room capacity. I'm thinking that's going to be on documentation I received today. It's not on the map that I can find. So I'm not sure what you mean by room capacity. It said that we should be aware of what the room capacity is. So Chris, why I don't, don't you go ahead and why don't you go ahead and speak to that? Me? Chris, no, Chris, Chris, that, Chris sees Chris, it. Yeah, Chris just stepped away, but um, I would assume that that would be the total room capacity within the space. So you would note what's posted on the walls. Is that correct? I guess I just missed what the where what we said that triggered the question because I'm I'm not sure what I haven't run into a situation where for any reason we were exceeding room capacity and admitting voters to vote. We right. can't really process voters right. fast enough at the check-in where to my knowledge that's really been an issue. The only okay. time issue was in 2020. When in we 2020 when we were doing distancing. social distancing. Right. Um, yes, the, the schematics did have a room capacity in 2020. Okay but okay. it's no longer in effect. Great. Uh, the other thing, I'm a, I'm a rookie, so I should know this, but I haven't had a chance to go back and look for everything. Uh, the, do, do the election, um, the check-in judges need to see ID for the people who fall within the 21 day rule? Or can is the voter just telling them their new address and saying that they've moved within 21 days? The only people that you need to get ID for, for are the people who are are marked as show ID in the in the poll book that you've got the procedures calling for that for. A voter who has moved within 21 days is a voter who's effectively um, they are they're going to be going and voting a. Um, Standard ballot. They're going to be voting a regular ballot. And what they're effectively doing is providing the information to do a change of address with our office. They would not need to provide ID in order to do a change of address with our office normally. And so they don't need to do that at the polls either. Okay. We will send a notification to both their old address and their new address. So we do have checks in the process where that can be verified. Um, but um, but there's no need for ID in order to accomplish a change of address with our office. Perfect. Then to confirm the precinct, um, I they would just do uh, put in the address and pull up the precinct because they also can only vote a standard ballot if they are within their precinct, right? So that's a question about the procedures for same day registration, and I'll pass that one back off to Julia. So. Let me ask you, do you mean just for a voter who has moved? Yeah, they've moved within the last 21 days. Right. So and they're telling me their address, but I'm not finding them as the check-in judge. So well, I'm doing yes, a change well, of address, but then how do I find their precinct? But for a voter who has moved within a 21 days, you're, you're, they're going to vote where you, they, where you are because you only have the ballot for that precinct on election day. 
You remember, this is not early voting where you have the ballots for all the different precincts. Right. And so they can vote a standard ballot. Right. And if they're not in their right precinct. Well, the idea is this is the precinct that that matches the address that's in the poll book. Right. And, and presumably the new one matches, too. And this is why they're here. If they're if they're out of precinct, it, they're going to vote provisionally. And that's what I don't understand how I will tell. I, I, will I just put the address in the poll book and it no. will it, it will pull up, uh, you know, the, the precinct number for somebody else who used to live there? No, for, for a voter who's moved within 21 days, mm -hmm. you don't need to do anything but give them, but, but vote, let them vote the address that is already in the poll book, which is going to be in that precinct. And they will vote that ballot. So you're not, you're oh. not, you're not changing. To, that's going to happen. That's going to take effect for the next election. I see. Okay. Right. Okay. So they are going to, if they, if they are here and, and they show up and it's this precinct, yes, the poll book, then they vote that ballot. If they're not in the, if their old address is not in this precinct, I should give them a provisional ballot. Well, it's not, it's not going to be about their old. So what they're going to vote is whatever's in the poll book, because remember they're in the poll book, but they're indicating to you that they've that they've moved. But there's an address that's already there that's within the precinct, and and that 21 days ap applies to the close of voter registration. So they've moved within the, they they moved too late to change it. So we allow them. It's a great it's a grace period of sorts. So right. they, they, can, they can still they can they can still vote that address that's in the poll book. Right. Uh, Julia, but I think I understand her question. Okay, go ahead, I got John. a question. Thank you. She's saying it's because some voters will do this. They will look up their new address in the lookup online and they'll go to that new precinct, but they're not there because they're still under their old address in their other precinct. If that happens, they have to vote provisionally because they're not in the poll board. Okay. For that precinct. Okay. All right. Good. And um, then the only other thing is, I can't remember from training, there were a couple of situations where um, you could have multiple reasons for pro provisional, and I can't remember which scenarios those were. Well, that would be, so all those scenarios will be in, in the poll book and in the documents that you have available at your precinct. Okay. So we, don't, we don't expect you to have those memorized. No. <laughs> and, for the mo and, for, and, and for most of those, when you go look up that voter, the poll book uh, there's, will tell you that they, they need to vote provisionally. There'll be, there'll be a, a, and that status field, it, it'll have something in it. And it will tell you, here's the code. Here's, here's the reason they, this person needs to vote provisionally. And then when you, then when you select, and it, the only option will be that they can vote provisionally. And then when you go to that screen, there's a drop down menu that has all those different reasons. And you'll read that reason and select the corresponding code. Sometimes there's two, and that's what I was trying to remember. One last one. How do we know um, that the um, the observers and the watchers are official? What they is need, they need to come with some type of of documentation, a, a form that from whatever organization is sponsoring them. They should come in with that, and that's okay. that's how you know that's how you know that they're official. They need to show that to you. They need to give that to you. You're going to collect that. And then you're going to give them a badge. You have in your chief judge's uh, supply bag, there's orange badges that say challengers and watchers. And you're going to give them uh, one of that badge to designate that that's what they are. But they need to come with you with the credential, come to you with the credential. And I get to keep it. And you get to keep it. And okay. they also need to sign in on the sign-in sheet. There's a, an area on the sign-in sheet for them specifically. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for all those questions. No, you're welcome. That's what we're here for. That is what we're here for. And don't sweat the reason code too much. I mean, we want we want the most accurate information. What you're doing when you tell us that reason code is you're giving our staff who are going to be reviewing that application, who are going to be making the determination of what the facts are surrounding that provisional ballot and whether that ballot should be counted or not. You're giving them clues. You're giving them information. You're telling them what the situation is with this voter that is you know that helps them figure out what's going on and if there's a problem to solve it 
Um, but at the end of the day, if that voter is, if that is a registered voter who is eligible to vote under the laws of the state of Maryland, and we don't have another ballot for that person, the ballot's going to count. Don't worry that by clicking the wrong reason, you're going to disenfranchise somebody or it's, you're giving us the best information you can give us with that field. Um, Ron Schlesinger, you're the next person. Uh, hello, thank you very much. Uh, if I if I may be so uh, uh, presumptive as to uh, as to add some little bit of information that the last uh, uh, chief was asking, uh, please forgive me for that. Uh, the whole idea of of uh, under twenty one days of uh, twenty one days or less is that the voter presumably has not had enough time to update their information uh, with the Board of Elections. And so therefore we, uh, uh, we, we let them vote a standard ballot and, the, and use the voter update form to, um, uh, to uh, have the new, uh, the, their new address into the, into the system. For people who have moved longer than 21 days, uh, the assumption is that they have plenty of time in which to uh, in which to uh, inform the Board of Elections of their new address. And so therefore, they must uh, vote provisional if they go to the if they go to the, their uh, original precinct. OK, um, uh, in in some of uh, now the, for my questions, um, in some of the in in what I received uh, this morning, uh, at uh, at bag pickup, I have something called a ballot call, and it's attached to my blue sign bag. And I've never seen such a thing before. And I was wondering if you could tell me what it is and what it's for. That was never discussed at the chief's training, and I have absolutely no idea what it is or how to use it or anything. Sure, that's not generally something that's needed out at polling places. That's a relatively infrequent item that we would send out for some specific reason. Um, uh, Chris, are you available or Mindy? I don't, at the, I, I'm not sure how the information would be communicated out to Ron about where the placement is of that, where that um, bell call is supposed to go. It's basically a doorbell to be used in very specific reasons. Um, it, it, typically, oh, if there's some sort of an issue of accessibility at the polling place, and we um, we're we're making arrangements for somebody to be able to press the doorbell at a door, but where to put that bell and what uh, I I don't know. Without um, I'm not quite sure how that's being communicated out. Chris, uh, Chris is still downstairs, but okay. um, I'll take Ron. Is, can we get back to you on that? Because I'm not 100 percent sure if there's. A schematic or something of the actual location uh, i'd have to uh, get with kevin and, and find out is that something we can email to you uh you sure can also this ballot call happens to be attached to the blue sign bag and i can't figure out how to how to separate the two so um, it's is it zip tied to the bag um uh, yeah actually it is with a with a, a heavy piece of plastic that i, I i'm not sure how it's how to separate it so you should just be able to take standard office scissors or your kitchen scissors and and cut that off. Uh, okay. Uh, second point, my orange bag has no seal on it. And, pre and in previous uh, 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 elections, that orange bag uh, did have a seal on it. Is that something new or is it just that a seal is missing? My guess is that it's missing. The supply bag usually has... Ron, the supply bag usually would have a seal on it, but it's not a seal that you need to record. That that may that may just be one that is missing. Okay. The key is and that I, your your voted ballot bag has a seal. Okay, and I have no Monday night roster. Could I possibly have um, had the vote? Have the um, my uh, voting operations people uh, sign on the back of the Tuesday form? It's on. the same sheet. It's exactly the same sheet. So there's one section where you'll just have them initial for Monday night. And then directly next to it, there's a place where they would sign their name for, for Tuesday. I'll look more closely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Be before you go to the next question quickly, if you happen to have 
uh, a young VOP or poll worker who appears on both the poll worker uh, payroll and the future vote roster, mm -hmm. that student, that individual's uh, poll worker uh, service trumps or supersedes the future vote status. So what happens is uh, a lot of students who were 15 years of age for the primary have since turned 16, have gone, are vetted, are trained, and have been assigned. And the guardians are the ones that uh, select the precinct, select the shift, select the future vote training. And this is why a student not appearing on the future vote roster just coming off the street must and needs to be turned away because the guardian, not myself, places these students at their corresponding polling place with the corresponding shift. And lastly, if you happen to be at a polling place where you have two out of six possible volunteers, those students could earn additional SSL. So for example, uh, my son Sebastian is working from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. and you don't have anyone working from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., you could talk to Sebastian's guardian if he is available or she is available to come back and serve in the evening uh, for your 6 to 9 p.m. slot. But if you have a full roster, no additional shifts will be allowed, only for those precincts uh, needing additional students. I think the thing I'd like to emphasize of what Hilberto just noticed or just commented on is that those, um, and they may look young, but those 16 year olds, if they're on the payroll, they're, they're fully trained election workers, they're ready to work, they can be given full duties. Um, which is where that, you know, that that scenario where you might have somebody who is ba basically duly eligible for both future vote and to serve as a full-fledged election judge can can come up that Alberto was talking about. Um, but I know we have had situations where um, the chiefs maybe haven't been been clear that the high school student was in fact a fully trained election worker. And if they're on that roster, they are. Um, Susan, Susan Lane, you were the next uh, question. Hi, thank you. Uh, can you please just go over again the text messaging numbers and when did we choose that? Because I don't recall. Uh, sure. There, um, there is not a number that you can text randomly to send us information. What we have is your number and we'll send you a text. Okay. And that it's set up as a um, reply one for this, reply two for that. And that's how we will will pull you basically to find out. Um, you know, we have your information in our system and linked up to the polling place where you're assigned. So if we text you um, Monday night, we'll say please reply one if your when your polling place is set up and ready to go. Uh, and then whenever you text us back one, we'll we'll have that confirmation we're good to go, and then you don't need to. You don't need to call us. That helps, especially first thing in the morning on election day. It's just a way for us to get the most responses possible out of most of you and, and just minimize the amount of telephone communication that's required simultaneously. So you don't need to text us. We'll text you. We don't have a method for you to send us sort of unsolicited text messages and have us respond to them. It's really just a polling feature. Well, that's good. I, I Now I remember. I just, you just, mm -hmm. now that you said that, I totally remember. Thank you. Sure thing. Thank you. Um, Nina Coltno. Hi, this is Nina. Hi, Nina. Hi. Um, I'm a solo judge, a solo chief, and as a solo chief, I'm wondering if I may take security seals and tamper tape off of equipment before um, a non same party judge arrives to sign the documentation. If I'm holding on to the tamper tape or holding on to the tabs, is that good enough? Or do I need to actually take it off with the other person present? No, you need to have a judge from another party perform the duties that the co-chief would otherwise be performing and signing off on that. We need to make sure we've got the bipartisan checks. I figured wanted to, to 
just and I one other question. I've never dealt with the future voters. Did I hear Dr. Z say that um, the guardians have to participate in the Monday night meeting? Uh, great question. They don't necessarily need to participate while the student is setting up the voting booths and putting up the signs and posters and moving the chairs as per instructed. That's where you would take the opportunity just to share with the guardians your expectations of your child. They've been all trained. Mm -hmm. um, both the guardian and the students, um, but also communicate that they need to drop off. They need to, uh, when they report on Tuesday, a couple of minutes before their shift, they need to drop off and pick up their child. Um, like I told them at training, your child, like my son, they could be six foot two, 250 pounds. If they're 15 and under, they need to be dropped off and picked up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. And we're just, just so you all know, we're just going to keep rolling and we're going to answer every question, just like we would if we had a line of people after an in-person session that were wanting to, to talk and ask questions. You are all welcome to um, stay as long as you choose to participate in and gain the benefit of the Q&A. Um, but the um, the sort of outgoing content that we have for you is, is over at this point. So you don't have to stick around unless you want the benefit of this additional Q&A. Um, Bill Waller is the next question. Yeah. Um, hi. I uh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, way back when, in the beginning of the presentation with Aisha, she was talking. Uh, she held up a form for like one second, <laughs> and I never saw what it was. I had turned away. Okay. I started writing on mine. Um, so. This is a form, uh, yeah, I, I scribbled on it, but um, here is a clear one. Um, it has some information on it, you probably can't see it, but it has the recruiter's information on it. It has some position information on it. It also has like the start times of each position. So you know what time they're expected to arrive um, and what time they're expected to leave. And is that in our binder? It's, it's in the, the packet that we gave you this morning and it's nope. on a like nope. a neon green colored piece of paper nope. i believe not nope. there not not there but i'll i'll check with my I, i'll check with my code chief we only need one of them okay um if you don't have it i can email it to you no nope. the only colored thing i had was the payroll sheet the payroll sheet yeah um okay and the one other question was about um, room management, talking about the judges, uh, people's cell phones and asking them to put away. Uh, some of the newer generation actually have the earbuds and whatnot. So even though they might have put their phone away, they might still be working on their phone. How do you handle that? It's absolutely, you're right. It is sort okay. of the, you know, I have a... Um... I, I, I start to get the shakes myself if I have to be without my cell phone for too long. But, um, you know, that's what the, those are the rules. Those okay. are the, um, the regulation actually is phrased electronic communication devices um, may not be used and the right. word is used. Yep. So, um, you know, I know we've got signs that say to turn them off. The, the most practical thing for us to do for cell phones is to ask that they be put away because that's a good way for you to make sure they're not being used. But nothing needs to be confiscated. Nothing needs to be, um, you, you know, it's just they're not allowed to be used for any reason. Right, got it. Can I let my Rottweiler loose? Yep. Other than election, service. other than election purposes, which is why yeah. you are able to use it. But yeah, if I were walking around with my with my AirPods, you know, earbuds, I would um, I I would need to I need to put them away. I need to not use well, electricity. Yeah, I I got that. But sometimes there's been pushback. Okay, thank yep. you. Um, Margarita, I only have your first name. And I get the pushback. I want to push back on it myself. In fact, we here in Montgomery County did push back on it at one point. And the, the response we got back from the state was those are the rules. So that's what we enforce. It is hard though. Margarita. Hi. Yeah, it's Margarita. And I'm actually here with um, Martha as well. So two questions. One is, 
do um, my understanding was that the chief judges the were to be at the precinct locations at 5 30 not 6 a.m please because i think that's what it had said in the materials but i've heard 6 a.m spoken here can you please correct or confirm 6 a.m okay no, so plus 6 30 is when we are for the meeting, but it's the they're not Tuesday mornings, it's, it's at 6 a.m., not 5 30. Okay. And then the my next question is related to the provisional filling out the application, the importance related to line six and the different options there. Uh, if a person doesn't did not bring their driver's license or Maryland real ID and don't doesn't recall the information and they don't recall their social security number, but they have one, but which, how are they to complete line six? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have Julia go ahead and answer to your second question. On your first question, I just wanna make the comment, the, cause we get a lot of phone calls in our call center prior to 6 a.m. Um, the facilities are not required by contractually to be opening the door before 6 a.m. Um, but it is it, it is common. I know I would wanna be there early. I would wanna be trying to get in earlier. So it, it is not uncommon that we have chiefs who either have made arrangements or you know are able to get into a facility earlier than six, but they are really not required to do so um, prior to six. And so when we get the calls here at 5.30, 5.45, oh my goodness, my, you know, my school's not open yet. That's why. Um, uh, and I'm going to go grab a power cord while Julie answers your second question. What was your second question about line six and what to do in the case that the voter does not have the uh, license to put security number with them? So and doesn't that, know it and does not know the information. So, off the top. so in that case, they are so, gonna, that is a case where they're going to leave it blank. That's where it becomes important that on the bottom uh, uh, line, I forget what it is, but there's a line that asks for their their phone number and their email address because they will be contacted. Because any okay. uh, remember with the provisional, they're they're going to do voter, they're going to research this voter, and that's why there's that ten day period. But the, I was making the distinction though with that box six C. That is only to be used for the voters who do not, who have never been issued a license or ID card or social security, card. not just that they don't have it with them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. Okay. The next person is Samuel Briefs. Sam, if you're able to respond and be promoted to the panel, we'll take your question next. Otherwise, Janet, if you want to move on to Diane Flagg. Oh, there's Sam. Hi, Sam. Uh, uh, again, uh, first of all, thank you all for being here today. And uh, uh, I just want to clarify some uh, regarding challengers and watchers. Uh, an unofficial challenger uh watcher uh is allowed to enter the party room for the sole purpose of challenging the identity of uh other people trying to vote they can challenge uh the identity of a voter but uh that particular challenger must leave the polling place uh after the challenge is made That's uh absolutely correct yep Yes. Um, and, yep. And secondly, um, uh, in the reminders from uh, recruitment, um, the website URL URL um, on the uh, on this uh, document says www.77vote.org. Oh no! Uh, Typo. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's all right. It's a, yeah, so it's triple seven. We'll fix that for future use. Yes, Thank it's three can. sevens on our website. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, sure thing. Um, also, um, I think one of my uh, judges, um, 
uh, might be sick, so um, she might not be able to work on election day. Okay. So is it a question about the process to follow? Here, let me let me turn it uh, over to Ayesha to handle the, the process to follow when you become aware of something like that. Okay. Um, yes, I would like you to connect with Debbie. I believe she's your um, recruiter, mm -hmm. Debbie Hamer. Um, I'll let her know that you mentioned it and then I'll have her call you so you guys can just, um, talk about the person in question. Okay. But okay. the goal here is to get that sort of information to the recruiter as soon as possible so that we can make sure that we've got critical positions covered um, okay. and uh, yeah, and follow up accordingly. Okay. Anything else, Sam, or? Um, well, I, uh, think I think that's, um, uh, no, I think that's, I think that's all for now. Okay, great. Janet, can you go ahead and promote up Diane Flagg? Hi, Diane. Hello. Hi. Um, so I had a question about um, provisional voters using the BMD. I guess during the primaries, they said that provisional voters were not allowed to use the BMD, but I guess now they can. So I guess the process would be when they um, put their ballot activation card on the BMD, they will return back to the provisional table and put that ballot activation card in the envelope and cast it as other provisional uh, voters would cast it. Uh, so if you're if you're if you're a provisional voter requests to use the BMD, uh, you are gonna you're gonna send them over with that ballot activation card. Uh, in the envelope, so that that so that it stays with the voter, and then when they come back over, the, the, the key is going to be to get them back to the provisional area, and then direct them to fold it in half and and uh, uh, you put it put it in the envelope and vote that way. Um, if and the reason I say is that you take the envelope with them is just in case you are you have a crowd. And you don't want to assume that you have remembered which voter that is. Um, so that so they should go over with the um, with the um, vac in the front of the orange sleeve because remember the BMD judge is going to need that to uh, uh, you know to input the information on the BMD. And so, and, um, but yeah, but like the idea is to keep everything with that voter so to, to make sure it doesn't get displaced. And that is a change from the primary. Um, and like I said, it, it, what the change from early voting is that there is no designated provisional uh, BMD in the, in the provisional area. So if they, if they do elect to use it, we need to make sure the provisional judge, uh, both the provisional judge and so instructs the voter to return and that your whoever's working in that voting area is alert as they should be always that the, there may be provisional judges over there to make sure they get back. So it's gonna be a dual process. And then as always, the scanning unit judge should be on alert too, so that if somehow it gets past everyone else, they are paying attention and get that voter back to the uh, uh, provisional area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And the next person is Joey Montgomery. And I'm unmuting. Okay, I've uh, unmuted. And um, so uh, I'd like to, uh, I was gonna ask a question about the um, about the text, but that already got answered. Um, so, uh, but what I was gonna say about the spoiled ballots, uh, I from early voting, we were um, instructed to, uh, if, if one of the ballots, one of the three paper ballots was, was going to be spoiled about the tick part. I got that from Julia, but they were supposedly supposed to, and it makes sense to come back to the same scanning unit that let's say, you know, some of them had made it in, but then one of them hadn't, and it needs to get spoiled and then return back to that same scanning unit. I'm assuming that you guys are, uh, 
you know, uh, think that that's uh, the proper protocol for that. Is that that's correct, right? Yes, that's correct. And Joey, okay. in that packet that you got this morning, um, when you picked up your bags, um, you should have the, it's a, a document that says procedures for a three-page ballot. That is one of the bullet points, exactly what you just said. I, 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 the other judge picked up the ballot. So, I mean, okay. so I picked up the red bat, Vidal Rios, if you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, okay, beyond that, um, the other thing was about the provisional. If it's over 21 days, generally speaking, you know, just so that we're not oh, having the, the voter do too much um, paperwork. Certainly, I usually inform the uh, provisional judges at least one election day because, you know, uh, or, um, early voting, usually the um, uh, uh, center manager would generally deal with it, hopefully uh, make that clear. Well, no, because it doesn't matter. There's no 21 rule, rule, uh, day rule because the right. SDR can do all the, okay, the updates when it comes of address. Obviously, if it's over 21 days, the application on the provisional form can do the change of address. So if, if somehow one of the other uh, check-in judges g gives them the voter update, but they're going to vote provisional anyway, because it's a, then they're going to come over and they're going to have to do the application anyway. You know what I mean? They're going to be like, wait, I already did the paperwork. You know, they're going to be a little bit like, wait, why do I got to do this again? So, you know so, what I'm saying, Julia? So Joey, what I'm going to suggest to you as part of your Monday night meeting you remind them that in no case should a voter have a, both a, uh, an update form and a provisional application, right? That yes. if they if they've moved over twenty one days, mm -hmm. that that's provisional. They don't they don't need that update form because, as you said, the provisional application will serve as that. And if they do fill that out, uh, um, <laughs> apologize and I know. start because we do still need that information put on that application. Absolutely, I've seen that happen, and I and I try. You know, sometimes people are just autopilot. You know, the the, the check in judges, and yeah. they're just well, we're talking again election day, not um, you know uh, early voting. Okay, because yeah. I've done SDR, so um, I know that um. um early voting. So the other thing is too about the um about the uh the reason code one uh I'll just just be real brief and this is really the only other thing is the idea that um the only time I've seen because I've done tons of provisional before I got sort of like peer pressured into doing chief stuff. Okay. Um <laughs> uh is um uh, uh the only time I would ever see the reason code because you could only do one on the back. Uh, the VAC. Now, certainly on the application for provisional, you can do the multiple. The only one I've ever seen is 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 12 and 11 where, okay, 12 is they're off, off the streets. They don't have any documentation. No, they're not. They're obviously not pre-qualified, but not only that, they have nothing. Right. You know, I dealt with one of those at uh, EV11. So, 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 so in that case, as you said, they will have two reason codes, but the public is only going to allow you to select one. Absolutely. So you so select one. I do. I would always I'd start with that 11 that they're not pre-qualified. Right. Right. Put that select that in the poll book and then hand write the second one on the back. That's the case in any in any instance where they need to. There's two reason codes. Select one in the poll book and hand write the other one on the back and then make sure your provisional judge has indicated both of them on the application. And and just this is final, like, like uh, crossing the T dot in the I, is it, I, 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 I'm the kind of person where like, well, I want the predominant one first on the VAC that's really in the spirit of what's happening, let's say with SDR uh, or, or with any, well now, now since SDR is a little bit different, you know, obviously on election day compared to early voting is it, on this case, it, I put 12 on the VAC because she was, she had nothing, this one woman. Then when I went over, I walked over to the um, uh, provisional judge, which, uh, you know, had a certain amount of experience, but not as much as, you know, maybe me. Okay. And I said, make sure I, I'm going to have you put 12 and 11, well, 11 and 12, it doesn't matter because there's no real order, but because if I just put a reason code 11 on the, um, on the, on the VAC, that one's just, if they're just, uh, not pre, you know, not pre-qualified, but they might have some sort of documentation, that's that's but that's right. not, so I know that's a little bit of a, a in the weeds yeah. kind of a thing. And maybe you got, cause either way, they're going to have to have the same sort of follow-up yeah, for the uh, certif election certified by the 18th at the BOE with, right. uh, with proper um, identification if they want their provisional vote to count, obviously. So that's pretty much it. Okay. <laughs> thank you for uh, taking my Answer question. Yourself. Okay. okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Um, the next person is Leanne Dorsey. Hi, 
Hi, Leanne. We had you unmuted a minute ago. Hi there. There we go. Sorry, it took a, took a while to all happen. Um, Margarita actually asked my question about provisional, but I have two other short ones. Uh, one is um, for the Dropbox attendant, I think it's possible that I don't have a Dropbox, but if we do not have a designated Dropbox person on our payroll sheet, um, and the Dropbox needs to be closed, then we need to designate somebody to, to do that, presumably. That's correct. That's correct. Um, and then with regard to SDR, only if you do not have a designated SDR, the chief judge is the only one who can do SDR. Uh, that's correct, right? Well, Malian, so you're the only other judge who has been trained to do it, is what I would say. So if you do not have an SDR judge, and it is difficult when the chief gets tied to a station, uh, then you would have to pick someone and, and train them yourself if you're going to have them uh, fill that role. But the chief judge is the only other judge that went through any, besides the SDR judge, who went through any kind of training for that. Um, so if you designate someone, you make sure that they have, they know where all the documents are, that you've, you've walked through something with them to, to make sure they understand the process. Okay, and if, if you don't, I was a solo until last night, and thank goodness that is no longer the case. So there might be some possibility for a chief judge to pop in and out. If that is going to be the case, should we detach the scanner? And so that, I mean, I think there's a greater likelihood that there will be a number of voters who could use the various um, poll books. Well, the, yes. So the then, scanner, then there is that the- that the, the, scanner doesn't, the scanner doesn't affect the regular check-in. You can leave it attached. It you only it's only when you need to use it and you depress the the, the little yellow button that's on it. Right. So we, in other words, we, we just leave it. Check in regular vote. Leave it in. Yes. Leave, leave it in there, and then but if we assign a VOP to that whole book until we need to go there, can we just say, uh, you know, do you you are not authorized to do SDR, right. and then is that okay? I would just right just put it in the back. I mean, just, just I I wouldn't detach it so that you don't want to risk losing it just push it off to the right. side you know tell them not to use it the same token is if if you need to use it you know some that poll book's being used as a regular check-in and somebody comes in an sdr and you as the chief want to do that you can detach it connect it to any other poll book and then use it there's nothing there's nothing there's no special programming for that poll book it is the barcode it's, okay it's two things it's the barcode scanner itself and the knowledge of the person using it that makes it an SDR poll book. Okay. Okay, great. That's, yeah, the, what my question was whether it was a, a special poll book or not. And, um, and it's, and we can have somebody use that poll book when it does not need to be used for SDR. Yes. And, and I mean, with the, with the scanner attached to uh, it. Yes. Just, yes, you okay. Can, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I'm going to make a, I'm going to take this opportunity to make a general comment and, you know, Aisha may want to follow up or Julie may want to follow up on it as well, because you just spoke to a, a situation that is, um, you know, it's not unique. We try to avoid those situations, but where you as the chief find yourself in a situation due to a staffing shortage, due to a crunch of volume, where you are, you're having to train people on the fly to do something. Um, you know, we certainly want to avoid that, um, but we definitely recognize that there there have been occasions where that happens, where you just get a whole lot of provisional voters and you need somebody to help, where, you know, you, a, a situation can happen. Rely on that um, uh, roster to tell you what position those individuals were trained to perform. Don't assume that anyone was trained to perform a duty that is not indicated on that roster. Um, and it's just one where you you rely on communication and, and people sense, but um, definitely, 
you just throw in somebody at the provisional who's never been trained to do it is something that's going to require some some hands on and some assistance. And um, you know, the um, we are in a moment of transition right now where we have a lot of voters who are moving toward voting by mail. We have the same number of polling places that we have ever had in an election in the recent past um, on election day. Now, I, I can't tell you what turnout is going to be on Tuesday. That's not my call. It's up to the voters to decide whether they're going to show up or not. But I can tell you that because we are seeing such an increase in the volume of vote by mail, it is likely that in many cases, a lot of your polling places are not going to be as busy as they may have been in the past. Um, and so, you know, hopefully, fortunately, if you find yourself in that situation, you're more likely to, you know, have a spare poll book, or you're more likely to be able to take that extra time to really train somebody on the fly, or to even get them on the phone with us here at our help desk, where we have um, people who are, um, where we have trainers, where we have people who are knowledgeable to be able to help you with the, the technical support in those kinds of situations. So um, I would ask you to avoid um, reassigning people and giving them new duties on the fly as much as possible. But I do recognize that there are situations where that occurs and when it occurs, um, that is certainly information that needs to be communicated to the recruiters um, so that they are aware. Um, that'll often be a situation where that judge may be coming back to us and saying, hey, I, you know, I want the additional pay because I performed some other job or, or, or something. So avoid it if you can. If you got to do it, just know that they're not necessarily trained to perform those duties. And, you know, we're here as a support for you and it's a support for them to, you know, to help meet the need of the voters. Julia or Aisha, well, does either well, one of you want to add to yeah, that? Julia will add in all cases, whether they've been trained or not, remind everyone, follow the job guides. Okay, the step-by-step. -step. The, the, you'll have the most updated versions in the precinct. They're on colored cardstock. Your most updated procedures uh, for your equipment are in your chief binder. So in any case, if, when in doubt, follow that. If you're training someone, have them follow that. It may take a little longer for them to help serve the voter, but the accuracy is more important than the speed. As Allison said, I want to just want to reemphasize what she said about don't assume that someone's been trained beyond what that position is. That's going to be particularly true for your closing judges. In the past, it was different. This current cycle, your closing judges were only trained to assist voters at the scanning unit and to close, help you close the equipment and, and transport the materials. They have not been trained on the ballot table, certainly not on the poll book. So when they come in, don't set them down on that poll book because they have not been trained to do that. That's one, but I said, I know that is a change, but just be aware of that, okay? The other highest risk situation that I've seen, and I, I recognize that it happens at times, you know, you get maybe a crunch of provisional voters, but if you have a vote, if you have an election judge who has not been trained for their duties as a provisional judge and they get thrown at the process, that is when we find ourselves in unfortunate situations where paperwork doesn't get filled out completely, where we have to reject a provisional ballot that we might otherwise have been able to accept because that election judge just was not trained to perform the duties that they were um, that they were in a position to try to help with. And that's, you know, nobody wants to be in that situation. So just watch out for that. And we are a phone call away. And certainly if you're the closing, um, provisional is the other big one that comes to mind. If you're, if you find yourself, which I really don't think you're gonna see much of this election, but if you find yourself in a situation where you need to train somebody on the fly for provisional, Make sure you train them, make sure you sit with them, make sure that you get them on the phone with us, make sure that they actually know what they need to do in order for us to be able to count that voter's ballot, like have it get signed. Um, Aisha, did you want to add to that sort yeah. of Just one scenario? thing, um, sometimes we have um, people go through the process and they end up taking a training and not actually serving in that position. So if you call us and you need something filled, I know, for example, we have a couple of chiefs who've taken chief training, completed chief training, but are unable to serve the full day. So now they're serving in another capacity. So that's a resource that you may have in the precinct that you don't know if you don't communicate with us. So if you need to make a change, um, you know, just give us a call and maybe that's something that would be beneficial to you if you need to fill a, fill a hole. So. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry for that little uh, detour there, a topic that was near and dear to our hearts. Daniel, Daniel Hellerstein. Yeah, you guys are doing great, or gals. I have three procedural questions. First of all, following up on the, if uh, you put a bell, one of the pages gets accepted, but one has to be spoiled. The person brings it back, spoils it. In the meantime, while the person's spoiling the ballot and redoing it, can, can other voters use that scanner? Yes. Okay. Yes, other voters can use the scanner. All right, so they just have to come back to the original. You come back to the original, that's right. Right, right. okay, good. Uh, this, this is just like having that back go in the right box. It's a matter of the accounting being straight for us on the back right. end to be able to reconcile everything. It's not as if the voter's ballot isn't going to counter something if right. it goes into the wrong scanner. It's a you know, it's an accounting thing for us to be able to have to untangle less information on the back end. Yeah. Now, second question, simple one. Where do you store the wait time measurement cards? Where do we put them? Often, uh, I tell you what most people do is they clip them together and put them in one of those pockets in the cheap binder. Okay, where they are right now, in other words. Ex exactly, exactly. And lastly, this is a little obscure. Um, I know that in the primaries are a little confusing, but if the voter says he wants a BMD when they're asked a question at the poll book, what you're supposed to do is give them uh, a back in the middle and something directly to the BMD table. They yeah. should not go to the validation table. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Right there at, che at check-in, give them the back, direct them to the BMD. Yes. That's all. Okay. Okay. The um, Tom, I don't have your last name. Hi. Um, so the thing I have is about uncredentialed uh, watchers. Uh, they're supposed to leave right after they uh, participate in a process, but why would they have come in in the first place? They don't, are they assuming somebody in line is uh, not who they, how would they possibly know? So there's no such thing as an uncredentialed watcher. There's this very specific category of a challenger where that is someone who is literally following someone into the polling place and saying they are, they're lying to you. That's not, they're not who they say they are. It's a, I, I've honestly, I haven't personally been involved in seeing this happen. It's kind of a hypothetical scenario that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sure it happens from time to time. Um, but it is, um, it is just as you might have a, um, say the electioneering, the campaign folks from outside will enter the polling place briefly for a specific purpose of checking for the, you know, the the counts if we haven't posted them on the door or, you know, just the same thing. You have an individual who is entering the room for a very specific purpose that is covered in the challengers and watchers manual. Um, it is not a credentialed observer because they are not there to observe and they're not allowed to stick around and observe. Um, you need to have those credentials in order to basically, you can't just loiter in a polling place. You have to stick around, you have to have the authority from someone in order to be able to, to hang out at the polls. Does that answer the question or? Well, it, it answers the question for the purpose of running the polling place. And that's all I need to trouble you with right now. One One last thing. One of your staff said a real ID uh, in talking about the driver's license. There are thousands of driver's license out there that have not been converted to real IDs and are not one. So it's just a driver's license, right? A state driver's license, regardless of whether it's a real ID or not, right? Um, yes, that's correct. I just wanted to make sure because yeah. the statement could be confusing. You know, it wouldn't have a barcode, it wouldn't have some bells and whistles, but that's okay. It's still a driver's license and it serves the purpose. I guess I'm not sure which purpose. So for the purposes of scanning um, a, a driver's license, it's if it's going to scan, it's going to scan. If it's not going to scan, then you'll have to, you know, proceed on that basis. Um, but yes, the driver's license, of course, also then counts as a, a government issued document for identification purposes as well. Okay. That's all I need to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Yin Zhang. Hi, this is Yin. Um, I have a, um, a you know reviewed the um, the uh, chip bag with uh, 
uh, co-chief this morning. So I have a, a, a few questions. Uh, the first uh, first one said uh, um, you talk about the uh, 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 BMD the updated because uh, the when well, at a closing right you uh, normally put that uh, member stick so now we don't need to do that. Do you have the updated information uh, so I can share with uh, my coach Nia? I, I don't know whether he's here today. Uh, he might not be here, but if you have something in writing, can you send it to us so I can prove to him? Sure. So in you should have received a packet this morning a, a separate envelope uh, we did not, you did not with the same we with, saw the original one uh, original uh you know just telling you the instruction to tell him that put it into the uh the bag so so maybe it inadvertently didn't get to yours so if, if i can um you may have to call afterwards and I guess I can take it right here uh get your information we can email it to you but that should but in every packet that updated page should have gone out. You and mean what the separate, uh, separate uh, 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 bag, right? The the separate bag you have that, but in the instruction we did not see the update. That's what I mean. But I did I did that's not. What, that's what I'm saying. That's a, it's a replacement page. Oh no, we did not see it. Okay. Um. So I've got your name. What we will do is look up your email and get that yeah. sent to you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. A person is Neil, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if it's Neil. What, what do you know? What precinct? What precinct are you in? Uh, Stone Mill Elementary School. All right, we'll get that sent to you. Sorry about that. That's a. Uh, the second question I have. Um. Um. It's about provisional. Uh, we uh, as this morning we did not have this uh, uh SDR. We don't we don't have a provisional <laughs> judge. All right, let me let me get you back to Aisha. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, so in that case, I do have to um, connect with your recruiter and find out if someone who's taking the training today or tomorrow will be assigned to your precinct. Um, can you tell me the precinct number? Oh, I do not have that because I don't have the bad. It's Stone Mill Elementary School. Stone Mill. Okay. Eighty two something. Uh, uh, um, and I will have them um, connect with you on on the roster, okay? Yeah, yeah. We don't. We we are thinking. Uh, Neil and and I, I we know someone uh, uh, in the roster already had you know had chief training, so we might ask uh, her to do the same day registration. But provisional, we don't have anybody. Okay. Um, we, we can take a look at it and just to okay, confirm sure. that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Uh, I have another question. So, you talk about a uh, link of women uh, voters. So they would uh, bring some identification so we know who is uh, instead of just look at the badge, right? Uh, they they are only required to have just they have that badge with the identification. That is all they were told. To, that they uh, okay. And they have a badge. They also they have a very specific. It's a it's a form. It's a carbon copy form. It's a it's a very official looking document that comes from the state of Maryland that they are there to, it's basically a site survey that they're there to complete. So um, between their identification, between their badge and the, the form, the, the form that they're there to complete, you'll, I'm, they'll be able to uh, indicate to you that they are there with the League of Women Voters to perform that task. So they, do they have the form or we have the form in the, I forgot, they have the form. in the, they have the phone, okay? Yep. So how close they can watch? Can they follow, you know, go to the batch table, uh, you know, and then go to the uh, BMD, go to scanner, but stay, uh, they can't go anywhere, but except like uh, not looking at the voters, what they did, right? They are, um, they're there to conduct an inspection. It is actually an inspection that by, um, state the state requires every local board to either have its own staff come out and check up on the each of the a, a percentage of the polling places or we have the authority to contract that out and that's what we've done we have actually contracted with the legal women voters to perform this inspection on our behalf and among the things part of what they do is they're there to check on the signage and make sure that we have all the legally required signs up but part of what actually they are required to do is they are required to go to each station and they are required to observe a certain number of voters being checked in a certain number of voters at the ballot table 
a certain number of voters at the BMD, a certain number of the voters at the scanner, and they are checking off that, yes, the election judge did ask them for their voter authority card and did initial the card and did say all of the, so it it is, um, you know, they're, they're there as partners, as collaborators with us, um, but they are in fact there and you can take a look at the form and the questions that they're answering, but it does require a certain level of access for them to actually check and see that the voters are being, um, are being, uh, communicated with according to the state legal requirements. Yeah, that, that, that's why I think uh, in the on the Monday night meeting, we should let judges know because otherwise they will see, oh, someone so close, they are not prepared, you know. Yeah. They might be very close just behind our judges. So if they don't know, they will feel very uncomfortable who is there doing that. Yeah, they're required to check in with you as the chiefs when they get there so mm -hmm. that you are then able to communicate with the with the workers and they're not necessarily coming to every single polling place either um mm -hmm. they're they're going to hit a percentage of polling places they're not necessarily everyone okay the other question uh let me see provisional uh, on the provisional i did not look at the uh, phones uh, you know the instructions specifically today but i know in the uh, primary we do have a um, question about like uh the fields that we require voter to fill out uh, I know that the CCCSP or uh, those, but how about, I think I remember number five about gender or those things. Do we just, do we just follow like, a, I'm assuming that on the instruction, you will set specific few that voter have to fill out, right? Other than that, we, we don't ask anything else. Is that true? Right, you, you, you give them that application and tell them to fill it out completely. And remember the first thing that they should be handed is on that application that that you tear off that sheet mm -hmm. and that's instructions and part of that instructions is telling them what they should fill out and it, but they but they want to fill out all the fields that apply the only one that the only thing that they're not going to fill out is um uh the there's one that says is this a primary or a general election and it says general you want to tick general so because of that I, i'm trying to think if it's line nine or something but there's only one that they're not going to complete because it's not going to apply because it's a general election all the other lines they should be completing uh really because on the okay. primary i i saw i only observe like a um a couple of times how to fill our provisional i know that there's uh you know there's like a 5a uh, is not required so i just wondering how you know uh we you know, right. Well, it's it, like I said, some of them, some, there's a couple of the fields that it will tell them if it doesn't apply. The one you mentioned specifically was gender. Mm -hmm. um, they, they don't have to fill that out. I, the primary purpose on that one, my understanding is for folks who are wanting if in the case that they, the gender has changed, that is a way to indicate that. And um, also but I was not asking, but we're not asking them to complete that one. Yeah, I was uh, uh, also uh, told that uh, it's important to fill out that field because you know, for a lot of name, like uh, even like uh, our name, you cannot tell the gender that when there's a confusion, it's easy to identify the voter. It will help uh, help the uh, process. It, That's what it, 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 that perhaps, but just in pur for purpose of voting, we don't mm -hmm. require gender. We don't we need to know what their gender for the purpose of being a registered voter is okay. the, the answer I would give to that. Okay, uh, I think I have, sorry, um, sorry, let me Last one, I think I have last one. Uh, for the SDR, so the scanner will come with a poll book. So we have a specific um, poll book with scanner together. Well, no, no, your, your, your barcode scanner will arrive separately. It'll probably arrive in the box with your router and then you're going to attach it to one of the poll books. So okay. that for that in they register, can we register regular voter or we are not allowed to? Okay. Like you have a designated uh, poll book right. for SDR, right? Right, but, and then, so if I understand correctly, that same poll book that you've designated SDR, that can be used to check in regular voters. All your SDR judges are trained as check-in judges. Oh, okay. And so we told them that you the majority of the day, they're going to just be checking in voters. And okay, then, and then you just send down if there's a new voter, you just send it to them. Okay. That's a, that's a, that's a regular poll book. A uh, last question: Is a uh, state ID the same as driver license? Can they uh, place each other? 
No, the like, same ID is for someone who where it's not yeah. a driver's license, but it is still issued by the MBA for so they can have an, an ID, but it's not a driver's license. Okay, so uh, they can use a state ID too. They can use that for the same purpose. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, the next person is Colin Vale. Oh, it's Fred, Stone, Fred Stone this is before Colin. Sorry, Colin. Fred. Thank you. Two questions about phones. Uh, Chris said that the uh, if, if we have Nope. It looks like we've lost Fred. Fred, we'll get you when you call back in or when we're able to get you reconnected. Janet. Fred's there. He's there. He's coming back on. I, I actually moved him back to attendees when I was trying to move the other person. Okay. Are you there, Fred? There we go. Sorry about that, Fred. You can start again. I am here. Sorry. Technical issue. Um, yeah. I had two questions about phones. Chris said that a phone issued by the board for the polling place should be connected to the jack with the yellow dot. Is that a change or is uh, did she mean the green dot as it has always been in the past? It's, a green it, it's actually a green dot. OK. And the other question is about uh, the voters uh, phones. In early voting, they were being asked to turn them off or put them on airplane mode because if they're just put away and not turned off or on airplane mode, then the, they might ring and everybody in the polling place would hear it. That's fine. Yeah, the, the bottom line of it is that they're not allowed to use it. And so, you know, at one point the signage said, uh, turn it off, but they're really not it's, legally required to turn it off or to put it away or anything else. They're just not allowed to use it. And so that's that's a good way of handling it, yes. Thank you. Okay, Colin. Great. Yeah. Nope, we lost Colin too. I'll give a minute for us to get Colin back on. He disappeared. Okay, let's move on to Ellen and then we'll bring Colin back as when he returns. While we're waiting, can I just mention something to Dr. Z? Please do. Uh, the uh, forms for the uh, uh, future vote roster uh, still refer to voter access cards. We haven't been using voter access cards for many years, so there is no box for the students to assemble, and they are not asking uh, voters to place the voter access cards in the box. Yeah, those, that's, that's an old... Uh, outline that's still floating on EJ connections. So you'll receive the new one with the updated uh, tasks, like the, for example, returning the folders from the scanning unit to the check-in and things that reflect the current election. But that's an old one's in the floating. That'll be removed. Yes. And in that, we'll make sure we get that off of our website. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. I'm back. Colin. Um, some sh couple short questions and then uh, I don't know, open-ended. 
Um, what do VOPA, VOPB, and SPN stand for on the roster? So VOPA and VOPB are part-time VOP positions uh, in the morning or in the afternoon. And uh. SPN is a designated VOP who is um, who is bilingual, who is in a position uh. to assist voters who speak Spanish. Okay, cool. And, yeah. Um, so yeah, and I'll I guess I don't have an SDR, so I'll be training in SDR because I'm a solo chief. But I think you may you may still have one. We still we have some classes this weekend. So those those positions where we don't have one would be your oh not for that position. Uh, okay, not SDR. Okay. Not for SDR. That's okay. Well, you may get one, but if you don't get one, then yes, I'm sorry. Continue with your question. That's fine. Um, Secondly, I'm sorry, first time chief judge here. There's a the red one of those red seals on this red bag, but I'm supposed to check this red bag and make sure everything's in it. And there's a checklist in there and I can break this red seal, right? You said you are solo chief? Yes. Um preference would be for you to have someone of a different party affiliation inventory that with you. Okay. It doesn't have to be a chief judge. Um but when you get yeah, I have three people in my in my roster that I can pick, but I'll okay, I'll I'll communicate with that with them and try to meet up with them before the Monday night meeting. Yes, that's what, that's what we would recommend. Okay. There'll be there'll be a full field promotion for them. <laughs> All right. Um and then the third thing I guess is like uh kind of general nervousness about crazy people trying to disrupt voting and do crazy things like what's the escalatory pathway for that like obviously safety danger call 911 but like at what point do we call police non-emergency or just the help desk for whatever somebody's challenged five times and it's getting annoying or like i don't know so you just identify the first priority if you are ever in a situation um to call 911 call 911 Call 911 before you call us. Call us later to tell us that you called 911. Um, but deal with the emergency situation just as you would in any other environment in any other context. Um, as far as calling non-emergency numbers, dealing with non-emergency situations, call the help desk because we have a police officer right there with us who is identified to work with us all day long to deal with situations like that. So um, when you call us, you will have somebody on the other end of the phone at our help desk number that is um, both procedurally, you're, you'll have our staff there and you'll have someone there from the police department. You'll have someone there from emergency management. We have someone there from community use of public facilities, somebody there from Montgomery County Public Schools. We have resources here to be able to address any issues that that may arise at sort of one-stop shopping at our help desk. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next is Haiyan. It's Ellen, she's already on the screen. Oh, I'm sorry, there's a person after you is Haiyan, Ellen. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I actually have a quick question. I was kind of a little confused when you talked about the cameras from like the media in the poll places and you said outside of the poll places, they can't come into the actual polling room. Is that correct? That they can't come in? No, no cameras at all in the polling room. Unmute. I did, yeah, I got it. Uh, I didn't say that. What I said was, uh, if your money's set up, identify a location in your polling room where the media can set up their tripod to take B-roll. They cannot go live and they cannot interview voters nor interview uh, staff poll workers uh, because the poll workers are there to serve. They're not there to, inter to be interviewed. Uh, but the voters must be interviewed outside uh, the, the, the polling room. They cannot conduct interview nor in the hallway. They should, they should do it outside the physical building. Um, as it pertains to recording, like I said, just pick a spot inside the polling room where they will not interfere with, uh, as, with the poll workers serving their voters. And they cannot roam around the, the precincts uh, in order to take B-roll. Just to pick a corner 
And, uh, and then once they're done with their B-roll, they, they could go on their merry way, but make sure they sign in, even if, or they, even if they do or do not have credentials uh, from the Board of Elections. Thank you. And the other thing is, um, do you guys have any drivers in training standing by or any VOPBs? Because I'm actually, I think I've lost both of those. I'm not sure. I know I never had a driver, but. Um, well, we did have the VOP training this weekend, but I, I wouldn't be able to specifically tell you what all the positions, because the VOP B, VOP D, and the VOPs take the same training. Um, but that's something we can connect with your recruiter uh, for okay. something more specific. Okay, I'll contact Deborah. Thank okay. you very much. Yeah, thank that's you. great. Thank you. Hi, Ann. Hello, we can see you, but um, we just need you to unmute. Oh, let me see. There you go. Oh, okay. My question is about the same day registration. I know the early voting, if uh, the people come to same same day to register, they, if they, they offer the, I think the uh, accept the ID, they can uh, uh, vote by the standard uh, by note. So I wanted to know if the voting day, they still can vote the standard ballot or they have to vote the professional. Um, Julia, can you clarify what the differences are between early and election day for same day registration? Well, same day registration in terms of uh, who can vote a standard ballot versus a provisional. Uh, in regards to that ID, that's going to be the same. There's only one way that you can vote a standard ballot. You have to have a current Maryland driver's license with a scannable barcode that that when it when scanned brings up the message verified license. So that's the way that you can vote a standard ballot. In most other cases, voting, even the voting day too. Yes, on election day as well. The, the, oh, biggest, okay. the biggest difference is going to be uh, so during early voting you were able to update people's addresses real time. You cannot do that on election day. If they've moved, that 21 day rule applies. There's provisional situations that if they came in during early voting, you can send them to the SDR judge. And if they had the ID, they would may have been able to vote a standard ballot. That is, does not apply during early voting. I mean, on, on, on election day. The only thing that you can do on election day is register new voters. And the only way that they can vote a standard ballot is if they have that current Maryland driver's license with the scannable barcode that shows verified license. Oh, okay. Okay? Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Tom M. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Sorry, thank you. Um, I wanna confirm the no electioneering zone is 100 feet in any direction from the entrance and the exit to the building, correct? The no electioneering zone is as marked on the drawing that you received in your packet today at the supply pickup. It is variable. The um, Board of Elections has, and in the 2020 election, it was 100 feet. What you're saying is, that is correct for what the rule was in the 2020 election. Um, but that was a, the nuances of the governor's executive order uh, that provided for um, the rules were kind of simplified. Um, but now we are back to what the rules were prior to 2020. 
and uh, which is that the Montgomery County Board of Elections has discretion anywhere between 25 and 100 feet from the door to the polling place to um, to set that line. And so you have a photograph that has the um, marked signs for where the no electioneering boundary is to be. Okay, that's actually part of what led to my question. In the packet that we received this morning, it shows two signs directly adjacent to the door, and that's very problematic. Whomever came up with this for my particular precinct is poorly informed, apparently. Um, we had some challenges at the primary with this, and they would not respect the zone. Um, so I would like to take talk to somebody offline about this because what's shown in the packet is not is not a good idea. <laughs> it's a very bad idea, actually. Okay, let's do that then. Um, do you happen to have um, Chris Ezitz's contact information from having communicated with her at all in the past? Um, I don't know that name. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, uh, I bring this up because we had some challenges at the primary and we had people who would not respect the zone. We had voters being accosted. My follow-up was going to be, if they won't respect the zone, do we call 911 or do you want us to call you? Um, but th this, was a, this was a problem at the primary and now it appears based on this picture to have been made dramatically worse. Tell me which location it is. This is uh, 1205 Damascus High School. Okay, I'm not familiar with the situation there. So um, I, I was just saying Chris's information, although it's it's long to spell out. Um, can can but, you just email me it or uh, I can get yeah, one? Yeah, you know what, we'll do that room. because we have your contact information. Perfect. So I'll go ahead and send you an email and then we can communicate, like you said, offline to make sure that we address the issue here. There's certainly a tension between, certainly, you know, the campaigns wanna be closer and often, mm -hmm. um, you know, there are people who want that line to be farther away. So somewhere in between, there was a negotiated discussion and you know, a line was drawn somewhere. But if you're flagging for us as the eyes on the ground that that's a problematic place, we'll take a look at it. Um, we can change it. Our board can change it. We can send someone out to to take a look and, and move that line or just communicate with you based off of the drawing. So okay. we'll that. That, that would be good. That needs to be done. It, okay. it absolutely needs to be done. Second question is regarding challengers and watchers. So official, official challenger and watcher, are we required to provide them a chair? Um, I am not aware of any legal requirement to provide anyone with a chair. As a matter of courtesy, I would. Okay. Um, are they allowed to make unlimited challenges? What? Uh, an official challenger and watcher? Yes, they are. They are. So they can just sit there and disrupt and essentially challenge every no, person. No. I've looked at the form. We have to have them fill out a form and it requires that they state in a verbose manner the, the nature or the, the basis for their challenge, but there doesn't seem to be any criteria for that. So here's how we're going to do this. In the event that you have such a situation and you have a challenger who is presenting any sort of trouble to you at all, quite frankly, okay. um, but particularly a situation like you're talking about where mm -hmm. if you had repeat challenges, yep. what you would do is you would call us here um, at our help desk, 240-777-8543. And we would get you on the phone with our attorney who would walk you through or walk them through, get on the phone to directly okay. address the issue. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. um, last, if we have a voter, and I think you answered this before, but a particularly belligerent voter in the precinct, um, if they start to become significantly threatening, just call 911. You are the, yes, you are the person um, or you and your co-chief, if you have a co-chief, are the people who are um, in a position of authority there to determine um, whether, based on your judgment, um, this is a situation where you would need to call 911, whether this is a situation that, um, you know, what the appropriate mechanism would be to address that disruptive behavior. Um, we're certainly here as a resource and we would certainly ask you to call us. Um, 
after, of course, dealing with any particularly acute emergency situation. Um, you do have the authority to um, to regulate the presence of individuals there in the polling place. You do have the authority to eject someone, but we would ask that you um, certainly do your best to communicate with us in that sort of a situation. Um, do your best to communicate with your roamer if they're available to you as an additional resource. Um, and any sort of a situation like that is going to get escalated to our attorney and um, generally to our board as well. And so we're going to want to make that communication happen sooner rather than later. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the next person, I believe the name is Shanik. Tom. Oh, we had Tom. There's Shanik. I think you're muted still. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, something really wonky with the app. Sorry about that. Really quickly. Um, a couple of things. One, we do not have a provisional ju a judge for our precinct. It's 9-34 for Nielsville Middle School. Um, also, a point of clarification, I guess, for the future voters. Dr. Z mentioned um, if we have future voters that have a shift, an earlier shift, and we might need coverage later, does that mean that they are continually at the precinct? or if they have an early shift that ends at 9 a.m. and we need someone in the afternoon that they can leave the precinct and come back. Correct. So, okay. the, so the three vetted shifts uh, for the midterms, uh, you looking at the peak times are from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., and 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Um, as a chief, if you feel the penny, like if it's a, in a setting in an urban setting where it's very dense in downtown, um, down, down county per se, if you feel that your precinct would benefit from a student whose shift begins at 6 p.m. to come at 5 p.m., I don't have a problem. You just have to coordinate that with their guardian. But at no time can a student work more than, uh, as per MCPS, eight hours. However, the vast majority of precincts have six students already vetted, which means that I would just keep them at those three identified time slots. Um, for the presidential in 2024, we have them all day because just the foot traffic and their turnout is greater for a midterm. But okay. we identify those three slots because um, they, they, they'll be kind of bored if the foot traffic is, uh, is slow. Um, so we've identified those three shifts but you know your castle better than, than we do on election day. But just make a note on that roster, there's a, there's a part that says chief notes. So if a particular student uh, is uh, serving additional hours, just make a note. So manually, I will award that student the additional SSL hours. And it has to be a complete hour, not three hours and 11 minutes. It has to be a full hour, not half hour, not a quarter, a full 60 minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, last question is more of housekeeping. I know we covered uh, the use of cell phones, but snacking and eating uh, in the precinct, can we get some guidelines as far as that's concerned? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. That, I mean, it should be happening there. You should have a designated area where people can go and eat and they should go there if you know, they need to go eat. Um, you should have sufficient staffing to be able to rotate people and to make sure they get a chance to go do that. But no, they shouldn't be like sitting there eating a bag of chips at their pull book. Thank you. Because I've, I've had some dis discrepancies, I guess, um, um, over my time. So I just want to make sure that we are abiding by what the rule is. And there is no snacking and eating on the precinct floor. Got it. Thank you. That's all. Uh, Joseph White. Just coming on. 
while we're waiting, some people I know already promoted once. If you have an additional question, keep your hand up. If you just left your hand up, can you put it down for me, please? Ms. Hello? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, in, in use of phones, uh, during early voting, the language helpline for Vietnamese was singularly unuseful. Uh, would a chief be able to go outside the polling place to use Google Translate, which is what we did in early voting, to be able to resolve some situations, or can that be done within the polling place? So there's a couple layers of an issue here. Um, number one is your direct question, which um, I think I'm not sure if Hilberto has had to step away or if he's going to be unmuting and able to answer. Um, okay, I'll so let you go ahead and beyond, answer, Hilberto. I may have yeah. a further answer. Beyond Spanish, those identified in the polling place, you have the language line as a resource. I wouldn't start leveraging Google Translate. Uh, I would don't. Yeah, don't. The, the reason I asked is we used the language line uh, and it was singularly unuseful. Uh, the person had got her daughter on to try to translate. We could never get any information uh, to be able to have that, to have that uh, translation or information uh, proceed. So what we did then is we went outside the polling place to use a phone call in order to make, you know, because the person had even said, let me use Google Translate. So we went outside to do that. Is there enough? Do you so, have a suggestion? Should we run into that situation? Use the language line. But what if the language line doesn't work? So call them back and get another person. So let me let me answer this in a maybe a slightly different way, and then we'll come back to your. Sure. Um, this is a problem. What what you just identified is something that is um, the language line is not a volunteer service. It is a county vendor that is contracted to provide a very important service. And so if what you're saying is that you had a problem where there was substandard work provided by a county contractor, then what I would like to have is I would like to have documentation of that complaint in writing so that I can take that information and I can follow up so that our vendor can address whatever that issue was um, and so that the county can have that documentation of any performance issues with the vendor. So that's Very thing good. one, is that I'd like to get that information from you in writing. Um, thing two is that I will say that I this is not something that I have heard before. And so I am hoping that what you're indicating to me is a, a one-off incident of some sort of a problem. Um, and I'm hoping that you're not going to experience that again. Um, but it is definitely something that in the moment, if you are experiencing a, a frustrating situation like that, um, get us on the phone too here at the help desk, and maybe we can find another resource that can be brought to bear. Um, you know, Google Translate is not, um, you know, it, you, you saw Hilberto's response and facial expression on that. The quality of what you're going to get using something like Google Translate is, um, is certainly not what we would want to be using either. So I'd rather find another resource for you. I, I mean, obviously, first of all, I'd rather have the primary resource work and work well for you. Um, oh. If that fails, then I'd rather see what we can do for you here at our help desk before you, I mean, you did what you had to do clearly in a situation like that. And so thank you. Thank you for your resourcefulness. Um, but I would say that's not, you know, that's not ideal. Thing one, use the identified county contractor or anybody that you have who has those language skills in your, in your polling place. Thing two, give us a call, see what we can do to help. Um, thing three, I'm sorry that you had to kind of wing it on the fly and come up with a solution, but let's try to avoid that in the future. We, well, thank you. We, we did keep a voter happy. They got information. They decided they would go to a, another place regular day. We had a crush of about 30 people in from a senior citizen that had people there. So oh. <laughs> we, yeah. they ended up with a smile rather than a frown on their face figuring out how to do things. Oh, thank I, you. But I, I agree the language helpline was clearly the preference. And uh, the center manager called to try to work through that. But thank you very okay. much. I'm sorry that you experienced that. Thank you. Uh, Let's make sure we've got that. We're, we're humans in this together. Yeah. We're, we're fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mike Henney? Hi. 
Hi, um, I'm a solo judge and I am in a very, very skewed team. As in we have almost everybody is one party. I have uh, half a person, I have a morning person who's the opposite party. And then uh, in the afternoon I have one person who's independent. What happens if I'm in kind of a situation where for some reason they don't show and the only people are Democrats? What do I do about ha having things signed? Get the call, call recruitment, please. Okay, call the help desk basically? I'm sorry? Help desk or? Um, you can call your recruiter directly. Okay. Sometimes that happens and we do move judges um, to, to accommodate. Okay, yeah, because yeah. with, with, with two half day people and that's it, it's, uh, I, I just don't want to get stuck with uh, not being able to sign the paperwork. Sure, absolutely, I understand. But okay. if, if you're stuck and you find that any of your uh, non-Democrats don't show up, please call us as soon as you you know so we can try to move somebody okay. to that precinct. Good, good. That's, that's what I need. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, so I'm not sure of the list here. I see um, Lynn Parsons, you're next. Was, were you talking to me? I was kind of disabled while you were bringing me in. <laughs> no, nope, just saying that you're next. Okay, um, question about guardians and um, future voters. You said that the guardian has to drop off. Am I to see the guardian um, because my room is way in the back? Do I need to see them? Do they need to come in and make their presence know known both on Monday night and on Tuesday? Yes. Okay, so they will come into the room and do they sign in? The student will sign the corresponding roster on the corresponding line with their name. And then, like I mentioned earlier in the, the session, um, when you provide the students instructions on setting up the polling place, that's when I would encourage you to briefly speak to the guardians about the expectations. They were all trained and vetted, so they know that they need to attend the Monday setup. I think an hour is suffice for them to help you set up the polling place, send them home under Mary Way, and then you could focus on the uh, connecting the equipment, the poll books, scanners, et cetera, uh, counting the, the ballot counts, et cetera, uh, and all that that needs, that needs to occur on Monday. And then on election day, hypothetically, let's say my son, I as a guardian selected the 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. slot. I will walk in my child and I will say, Chief Parsons, here's my son. And my son needs to sign the roster and I will leave and I will come back a couple of minutes before the end of that shift. Great. And then, and that's it. But I just wanna make sure that you briefly see the parent. That's why the Monday is, is set up. And then you just say, thank you. And you go back to work on, on, on Tuesday. Okay. And um, to the uh, responsibilities of the um, future voters are, is, is that, a, uh, is the watching that, um, electioneering line something we should expect them to do or is that something that we need to get a, a poll worker to go out periodically uh, i mean uh, you know a judge to go out periodically and have a look at what's going on out there poll worker that's a poll worker task um, okay. the students when they come on monday they need to uh you know um get familiar with the layout of the precinct so if you have a student that's a greeter at the door and a voter asks a simple question, where's the restroom? The student will just say down the hall to the right, the double doors on the left, but at no time will a future voter uh, leave the polling place only when they leave with their guardians, but they're not supposed to go out to check on the no electionary or escort any voters out of the polling place to show them where the restroom is. Um, they're supposed to stay exclusively uh, within the polling place. Oh, so they can't even be in the hallway. They could be in the hallway. They could be in the hallway, right? Every okay. person is different, but they cannot go outside to check on the no electioneering to see if the signs haven't blown away or they or somebody moved the blue tape or they moved the signage. Uh, they cannot. That's that's a that's a that's a that's a judge's responsibility. And do they get breaks and they have to follow all the rules about cell phones, right? 
they're not supposed to bring a cell phone. They were trained. I told them right. no cell phones. And I told them they bring a cell phone and they use it. You as the chief will, will send them home. Okay. That's why on the roster, you have the contact information. So if you need to, you call Amy or, or Bree's mother and you tell them you need to pick up your child. They're not following the procedures. Okay, great. I'm going to interject here with a housekeeping matter, um, and I, I just want to preface this by saying that I I love the number of hands that we have up. I think that this, um, this tool, using the technology in this way, is giving us a really nice sort of office hours opportunity for those of you who want to stick around to be able to get the one-on-one -on -one attention to get your questions answered. Um, I was just about to say, because I did not have, a, some of our staff have other things that they need to do this evening. And so I was gonna go ahead and allow the staff who are participating in this to go um, to go focus on your other work. Um, and uh, and I was gonna just go ahead and continue fielding the calls and refer you know, as needed, what I needed to, to refer for any of our staff who were not able to stay on the line. But I was just passed a note here Janet, do we have a technical hard stop here? Do we have a time that we have to cut this call off? Or are we able seven, to keep going? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, okay. We're already over. I only, it was only scheduled till six. They haven't cut us off yet. Right. But I, they're gonna cut us off by seven. Okay. So um, I'm gonna um, I, I'm gonna keep rolling and ask answering questions up until that point as best as we can. But uh, what I'm gonna go ahead and do is give um, for those of you who for whom it would be more convenient anyway, or when we run out of time, what I'm gonna go ahead and ask is that you now many of you have contact information for members of our staff that you could follow up with or some questions that could um, could wait for the phones, but. I'm going to say if you go ahead and email election.judge at montgomerycountymd.gov, which you all should have that email address in your address books from lots of communications. But if you use election.judge at montgomerycountymd.gov to forward any outstanding questions that you have, if you don't get an opportunity to ask them tonight, um, then we will make sure to go through those and um, forward them on to the appropriate staff in order to respond to you by email. Um, we'll keep talking here for the moment. And I'm going to take this sort of outpouring of interest in having one on one questions answered. Um, and we'll see how we can, um, you know, how we can do some things like this more in the future in order to, uh, um, I'll, I'll see what other tools we can do. But for now, we're going to keep talking until seven. We're going to have a hard stop at seven. And any outstanding questions, unfortunately, after that this evening are going to have to go to election.judge at montgomerycountymd.gov. So, uh, Lindsay Turnbull, you are the next hand that I see up. Hello. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Um, so, I had a question because this was definitely like a thing in the primaries about about phones. Um, a lot of people like had their list on their phone. So they're not necessarily like using their phone, but it's basically a six page ballot. Um, so are we telling them like, you need to go out in the hall and like write all that down? Or can we say like, can you just put it on airplane mode? Like what? Nope, you gotta, I, I hate this too. And it was, we actually, Montgomery County went to the state at one point and tried to come up with another solution for this. But no, you are you do need to say, I'm sorry, you know, can you go to this area out in the hall and go ahead and get the information off of your phone, make arrangements for them to do that. I, I, I get that that's not a popular answer, but them's the rules. Okay, so our polling place is like at the end of a long, like what, if ideally they would do this before they're given a ballot because then like, we're at the end of a really long hallway. And so like, there's not a good place for people to stop and write things down outside of the room. So can we tell people like, as they come in, like before we even check you in, like you should we have our um, check-in judges telling people like before you even check in, you cannot use your phone at all. Like if you have notes, please go out and write them down and like then come back. I think that's a great thing to have somebody at the door saying to people as they come in, or if you have the, um, if you have a future vet student, if you have the manpower to be able to just 
talk to him at the desk. I, you know, I don't know that you're going to have a, um, a line to, you know, work. So yeah, I think that's a good thing to flag right at, right at the front. Okay. Yeah. I just like, there's nowhere for them to go. And then with people leaving and coming back and we have like ballots, like, I just don't want to have a stack of ballots that are half filled out and then what a nightmare. Yeah. Okay. If, if it's so they have to leave. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. If there if it's have any solace on the sample ballot, there was a portion that all voters okay. uh, mail the sample ballot specifically said no cell phones, make note your selections on this sample ballot and bring this to the polling place. You cannot use your cell phone. So hopefully that because I noticed that in the primaries that you guys were repeating yourselves a thousand and one times an hour. So hopefully if we could get a good percentage of voters who read that kind of label, you know, with instructions, hopefully that will mitigate some individuals from act for, you know, actually following the uh, the expectations laid out. Okay, um, hopefully we'll have some future voters and they can help with that. Thank you. Feel free, you know, with any of these things to also put any sort of concerns that you have in writing and these discussions are always ongoing about how to best balance the, because obviously, you know, voter privacy is a concern um, you know, there's reasons for these rules, but the state board is always continually looking at, um, you know, how to navigate this. So feel free to always put concerns like that in writing to us as well. And we can always keep the conversation going. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, Aristilis Vicente. Hi, how are you? Hi. I, um, I just have a question about, um, I don't have a VOP driver. Um, so you said that I need to ask um, if anybody be willing to do the driving. Um, that is correct, right? I would say call your recruiter. Yes. Okay. Um, let's connect with, Cole is your recruiter. Correct. <laughs> your recruiter. <laughs> Um, so let's connect with Cole just to find out um, what the status is. I'd also just um, because there were some training classes this week and we're we're still putting some things together. Check your um, your roster um, in EJ Connections on Monday, and that would have like the best okay uh, updated information. But yes, if 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 you don't have a driver, then we would. Um, ask somebody and that you can work with Cole on, on determining a person to ask for that role. Okay. All right. That, that's pretty much all that I had. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn Randall. No, I'm sorry, Jim Gilchrist and then Carolyn Randall. Hey, Jim. Hey there, how are you? Sorry, I'm just trying to open up my camera here. Um, I just have two quick questions. I just wanna make sure I, that we that I understand the whole point of, of the provisional ballot is to let the decision be made later, that the provisional mm -hmm. judge is not the final decider. So if you're in doubt, the voter fills out the ballot and then it gets settled later. Is that correct? Absolutely. I would say not even a question of doubt. The voter any question always, whatsoever. The voter will always receive a ballot. They if they're not eligible for a standard ballot, or if there's any question of their eligibility for a standard ballot, then they're referred to the provisional table. But they always get that ballot. They get that application, and it gets forwarded to us. Right, because there's time after the fact to settle that. Yeah. So the other the other question I have is about uh, about the observers. You know that that. Uh, when they're in a polling place, they can be behind the poll books. Otherwise, they must be escorted. Is that correct? And they're not to contact. They're not to be in touch with any voter that's in the facility. That's correct. Okay. And what do we do when they violate that? Uh, then you put all of your diplomatic skills to work in trying to get them to cooperate with you and follow the rules. And if that fails, then you give us a call at the help desk here. And if 
Yeah, the reason I ask is our attorney or board member, we will. I, I, the reason I ask is on election day for the primaries, we had an observer come in who had never voted, wasn't registered, who said her first words to me is, hi, I'm here to stop you from stealing the election. And then she wanted to hang out until we counted the votes. And then she was dismayed when she found out that the votes don't get counted in the cafeteria at Petersburg High School. Right. So it's a diplomatic challenge is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yes, yes. So it, yeah, it sounds like you did what the best that you could do under those circumstances. And I, I actually had to ask the person to leave because they were interfering with my ability to serve the voters. Yeah. It's unfortunate when you need to do that. You you do have that authority and I'm, I'm sorry that it came to that. Um, but yes, in terms of resources for you to back you up, to um, help you navigate any legal questions. Um, uh, so to back you up on site, there would be our, our Roamer or if you had us or, or us when you call us. And then mm -hmm. if we need to, and we've done this before where we'll deploy, um, we'll deploy a board member of the same political party as the person who's raising, you know, creating a stir. Um, we'll send out a bipartisan team of our board members. We'll even send out our attorney or a member of our staff to sort of back you up if needed. Um, sorry you had a situation like that, um, but thank you for, yeah, th those are the resources well, and, we're able to. Well, the reason I, the only reason I ask is because the person was there clearly to obstruct us from serving voters. And I think that that's our job is yeah. to let people exercise the franchise. That's so. thanks. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Carolyn Randall? I'm mute. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Okay, just a couple of comments. I heard the discussion about same day uh, registration and scanning the license. I just want one caution. Um, somebody who's never voted before and wants to register, they may already be in the database. And if you don't check first, we have this problem at early voting. We scan the license and bingo, there were two records and now we have to get rid of one of them. So that's just a caution. Um, second comment, can we make our own sign about cell phones? I'm tempted to put a sign up and maybe there is one in the packet. I haven't looked, it says no cell phones, um, but that'd be bad. There, There is one and yes, you may make additional signage if you okay. feel it necessary. But what I would ask is that you let us know that you've done that, okay. um, you know, number one, just so that we can um, have that information. Um, okay. But, you know, maybe it's something that will prompt us to you know, say that's a great idea. We'll change our signage in the future. Okay. And then the only question I really had was there was a mention. Oh, oh yeah. Know, I was just I was just reminded by a staff member because we are required to make sure that um, election materials are translated into Spanish. Um, oh, I would okay. ask you to contact us sooner rather than later on something like that so that we can assist you. And if that's something that we need to provide you with a Spanish translation for, we would we would start. So make a sign, make it in both languages. I can do that. Yeah. Okay, uh, the final thing, the reason I wanted to talk was during each person's presentation earlier on, there were mentions of updated procedures and this is gonna be emailed to you or there's new instructions or there's a new page. Is there somewhere there's a summary of all those changes or can you just tell me it's all in the bags or are some of these new changes coming in emails? That was my question. So um, I'm going to defer to Julian Aisha here to tell me where I am wrong. I would say number one, it's either all in the bags or it's in the what we refer to as the last minute packet of the materials that we provided to you at the election judge pickup at the chief judge pickup today. Okay. Or what is it, Julia or Aisha, that is being sent out in email that was not in any of those materials? So, so the actual updates to procedures were sent out in that last minute packet. Um, and everything that I said is in a document that it's a bullet pointed document because I was reading from it that's going to be sent to you. It's, 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 I think it's going to be emailed through the recruiters. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we yes. Mm -hmm. um, but but the actual documents uh, that I was re referring to, 
to tell you about the three page ballot, the change to the BMD, all of those were in that packet, that, Perfect. that, that last minute packet. Okay, so there's a last minute packet plus one email that you're gonna be sending out whenever, tomorrow or Monday or whenever, right? Tomorrow. Okay, I'm hearing tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. And that's a summary of what you basically said today. Yes. Right, Julia? Yes. Okay, super. That's all. I just want to know what I'm looking for to get all the material. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think the next, to skip anybody who might still have their hand up from earlier, and if we have time, we can come back to people who asked questions before. The next, um, I think, would be Leon. Oh, no, Janet, you've got Margarita. Okay, Margarita. Yeah, um, my black bag did not have an inventory sheet. Was it supposed to have an inventory sheet? Blue Our blue bag, it's the one that has all the outside signs. The inventory sheet. You, so typically the, all the supply bags have an inventory sheet. I don't know specifically if the blue bag did um, with the signs, but all of the other bags would have a sheet with it. If And if it did not, if there one exists, we'll try to get that to you. But otherwise with the signs, typically we just say, just put all the signs back in that blue bag. Okay. Same thing that came out of it, put it back in. And that's all true, right. well, almost everything else. Okay, um, and then not all of the bags were tagged in terms of the initial things and for us to break the seal and double check the inventory. If we did break the seal, do you care what the new number is when I'm finished doing this with my no. chief? We just okay. ask that you seal it, but you don't have to record that anywhere. The okay. one on the outside on the supply bag. No, no. so, all right. And then um, just to confirm, just to let you know that at least for precinct 13, 30, 13, 35, there was no detailed sheet related to when some of these individuals would be coming if they weren't doing their hours, the full length of hours. Which individuals are you referring to? You um, what time the closers would be coming? You had that one sheet that you showed in the, the to say that I was supposed to see that in the, well, along with the payroll and the other items that was not included in my package. Okay, um, so two things. If you do have time, uh, visit the website. Um, there is a section on the website under election worker program that has all the position descriptions and timeframes. Um, I just put a summary there because it seems like sometimes um, not everybody was aware, but we can. Um, I will be emailing that also. So you'll have that in terms of what times. But if you look on the payroll sheet, it has, um, the position code. So if you see like a VOP dash B, that's an indicator that somebody's working a part time afternoon shift. Right, which is then like starting at three o'clock or two o'clock or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Leon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One. Um, Will there be any walk-in practice opportunities, say tomorrow? And part two is whether I can, um, my precinct assignment letter and the other judge, I don't see that anywhere in my email. Uh, I, hopefully it's not my scrap book, but I didn't know how I'd find that out. So um, no, there are no more walk-in practice opportunities. Our, um, our staff who would staff those are your roamers and are out there in the field or are equipping you know, materials for election day at this point. So the walk-in practice opportunities have ended, but um, we'll be here on the help desk starting at um, 5.30 on Monday night. And, um, and of course, we'll be here during the day on election day um, for any questions that you have. Um, Aisha, do you want to answer the question about the assignments? Um, I'm not sure I fully heard this, the second question, but also in terms of training, if you go to your EJ Connection account, there is a whole chapter. There's several chapters of training you can go through, videos, um, just to give yourself a review. And I did send something out um, a few weeks ago that had um, additional information uh, on the polling place. So um, that's a resource for you. And um, would you mind repeating your second question in terms of your assignment? Yes, I'm, I'm, um, I haven't been able to retreat, find in my email my, my precinct assignment and who the other judge is. Okay. Um, I'd be the non-Democrat. Okay. Um, 
So I have your name and I will have to go back to um, my office and look up that information for you. And then we can have, um, we'll call you and let you know. Okay. Peace. Got you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We just have a few more minutes here. So hopefully we can cover everything. We'll try to sort of move through them quickly so we can get everybody. Uh, Youssef Shakal. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. I don't have a, a provisional judge assigned. I don't have an SDR. I don't have students. So I have another chief. He just served last time. I, I, I could do both, but I think it's going to task me a little bit too much to do all the bookkeeping and do all the provision. I can do it. I don't know how many provision, how many SDRs. Uh, that's one question. The second question is the room layout. They put uh, the room layout shows provisional just near the exit. It's on the path of people going through the scanner. I don't see any privacy for provisional voter or canceling and everything. Can I change the room layout like I did it when I served in, 19, in 2016, where I put gave some privacy for provisional voter and uh, clear that space at the exit? So I can take that with Allison. Okay, go ahead, Janet. Okay, you can move the provisional. You all can move anything you want in your precinct except for check-in. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, to update. You can move it. We just give you a suggestion based on the layout we're provided. But if you need to move it, we're not out there running the precincts. No, the, yeah. You I mean, know your flow, so just move it. No, 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 but no. send us an updated schematic so we can adjust ours. And, and, uh, the other thing I was coming to question, if you send me the the CAD drawing only for my precinct, maybe I could, I have, you have all the, the like the, the equip, voting equipment to scale, I could grab them and move them to the, I have done that part of my work, move them, show them the right location, et cetera, et cetera. So we can- just, you, If you can you put can that in an email, put that, go ahead, mark it, mark it up, go ahead and put your request in an email to election.judge at montgomerycountymd.gov. And then we'll go ahead and, um, and forward that. We definitely would like to have your, have your changes um, yeah, they have yeah. been they have been sending me all that room layout all the time. Uh, this time, really, it doesn't work. And that's going to be the same for everyone that we're not able to get to. We'll we'll get to who we can, but for everybody that we can't get to this evening, email your question to election.judge at montgomerycountymd.gov. And in this case, Yusuf, that's going to be what we're going to need to do anyway to address your. Um, yeah. The address third, your, your layout. Uh, the third and fourth question. Third question I served during the early voting, I noticed the bags issued by the manufacturer uh, in 2020, 2022, they were jamming the BMDs. They were somehow the material glazing on those things, on those bags. The 2021, they didn't give us an issue. So even they are printed, when they go to the scanner, scanner doesn't read them. So we had to avoid some of these bags because of yeah. poor manufacturing. That is one. Uh, then we had issues with BMDs. They were not working properly. So we had extra, for, fortunately on the early voting. I, might, I have only two uh, BMDs. If, both of, if any one of them is bad or two of them are bad, do I have an extra? No, you don't. Yeah, well, then what do I do? <laughs> you will call the help desk and I will send somebody out to try to fix it. If not, we'll replace. We have some in reserve, but we cannot send them out just in case others break down. We have to have some reserve to replace what breaks down. Yeah, we, we fortunately on the early voting, we had 
in the in the cards we had some extra one reserved we'd use them when the other two we had actually two or three going bad my experience in the primaries i had two scanners coming there and they didn't function for the first hours so i called the roamers and then the roamer couldn't help then uh, we got somebody from it coming it took uh, like an hour to get and uh, while people were voting so so uh, this is precisely the situation that prompted the state board of elections statewide to create what um, Julia was describing earlier as the return voter card. That's a new tool. That's a new thing for you to give in this rare situation where you run into what you ran into, where you did not, in fact, at that time, have a functional ballot marking device. If you have a voter who needs to use the ballot marking device, you have that return voter card that you could give them. We never want to be in a situation to, which is kind of their, you know, cut to the front of the line card when they come back. Um, we never want to be in that situation where we have any downage with the ballot marking devices whatsoever. So do as Janet just indicated as far as communicating with us um, so that we can get another unit out to you. But if you did have a gap in time where a ballot marking device is not available, then that's um, that card would be given to the voters in the meantime. Uh, well, what happens? Uh... I got um, I got eleven booths for paper ballots to be marked. I have only two BMDs. Most of my voters in my precinct they prefer the BMD, so it's going to be a long line inside the room. I don't I don't know. I, I like to have a balance between BMD more BMDs than paper ballots. It's, I agree with you. Space in the room and they are useless. Um, I'm going to ask you to, to to put, and I think you have a couple of different issues here, and I'm going to ask you to put those in writing to election.judge at montgomerycountymd.gov. Things like um, your um, assessment of the um, preferences of the voters, of what it would put you in a better position to be able to serve the voters if you had more of this or less of that. That is all very valuable information for us to be able to include in our after action reports, in our lessons learned, in what we provide in our comments to our own board and to the state board. Um, and so I will, um, I'll close this out. I see that we have uh, half a dozen people that we were I'm, I'm, I really regret that we were not able to make the time to be able to answer your questions here in this venue. Please put them in writing to election.judge at Montgomery County. I, I already did. I already did. Election.judge at Montgomery County MD.gov. That concludes our session for this evening. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to handle any more um, election.judge at Montgomery County MD.gov. And thank you again for your service. And we look forward to talking with you on election day. Thank you. Thank you.